All right, hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is June 15th, 2023. And of course, here we still are. But you know what? After today's video, it, it'll be okay. You'll be able to take a, a breath. You'll be able to know that something I spoke about in the last video <laughs> that I know scared some people. And I know a lot of people, when they heard it, thought, well, no, that's not possible, just as I thought. There was also another brother I saw do a post, that um, a comment under the video, that said, well, we know it is possible. It is Jerusalem, after all. And, you know, there was a reason why I said it in the last video. That, you know, if, if it doesn't happen this year, what are we looking at? Another 14 years? before the 70 of Jerusalem is complete? <laughs> no, right? And then you think, oh my goodness, we got 14 more years, then Jerusalem completes their 70th year, and then the 14 years begins? Well, how on earth is that possible? Well, once we, we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit more about some harvest things as we get going, but when we start getting into the meat of this video, I thought it was a, a great title for this video. I think it's uh, The Grapes of Wrath, all right? This became very important. I, I was led through a sister that shared with me about um, the wording in Jeremiah 23, and I went into it, and I was looking at it, and I thought, okay, there's some good stuff connected to the beginning, but I'm going to keep reading. And I got to another chapter in Jeremiah, and... One we've all studied, you've seen it before, and it was about the 70 years. And <laughs> as I was going through it, I thought, well, hold on a second. This is great news. But in this great news, you're left scratching your head. Because within this great news, you, you have to try to then discern, well, how on earth is this supposed to happen before if it's after the 70 of Jerusalem that the rest of this happens? And I, I was scratching my head. You see, guys, what I do, I, it is Holy Spirit led absolutely. I mean, you think of the hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of revelations that have come through this ministry Minist uh, um, mysteries upon mysteries built into mysteries hidden since the foundation of the earth for a time as this. Well, that's what's been happening. But I'll tell you something. Sometimes I could read and I know. You know, it's been happening for a long time. As you guys know, it's not dreams. I don't get visions, audibles. I just read and I know. And as you guys know, it started about five and a half years ago when I was aware of it, that something had changed in my life. Well, it's not, like I said, it's not always easy. And this wasn't easy because everything about it, except the key piece it discusses, everything appeared to be after the 70 of Jerusalem, which is not for another 14 years. But I thought, <laughs> that just doesn't make sense. And the the reason as you're going to see and the reason for this title is so fitting but we've got to we've got to build it to there but i don't want you to get nervous once we get going into this section about jeremiah because everything around it is going to appear to scream to you after the 70 of jerusalem okay but i'm going to show you as it comes to a close, that it cannot be the 70th of Jerusalem when this all begins because of what happens at the end of the 70th of Jerusalem. So it sounds a little confusing. This is what I said. It's not always easy for me. And as we get later, the deeper and the heavier things of revelation that come to be revealed, my goodness, you see, but what do we know? There's a 70 that ends for Jerusalem, and there's a 70 that ends for Israel. Why on earth 
did it work out from when they came into the land equaling 70 and when they completed capturing all of Jerusalem? Why is it that it equals 14 years in between? You see, is that just happenstance? Is that just maybe kind of? You see, we've been lining up everything with this one. But when you go and dig into it, it seems like it lines up everything into the Jerusalem one. But once you see what it says happens at the end of the 70 here, there's no way it could be this one. And yet there's no way that when you read what happens at the end of the 70 here, that it could be the 14 years of tribulation starting after this 70. So there, there's like a, <laughs> there's like a, I don't even know how to explain it. It's kind of, it's kind of twisted the way it's hidden in there. But I promise you, as it builds and as you get nervous watching it, because everything seems to be telling you once this 70 is complete, you're going to realize that it can't be because what happens after this 70 of Jerusalem. You see, one thing we must always keep in mind is the thing that has been is that which shall be okay what was old testament will be that which is done which is new testament is that which shall be done so creation to christ christ to uh, um uh, uh, uh to the pre-trib escape and then it's the is to come but what was and what is both shall be now, both of these things, as we have shared so many times over the years, both of these things, okay, like Old Testament typology, New Testament typology that will play out in the is to come of the seven churches, these things played out over thousands of years. Yet the end of days is only 14 years. So 50 days and 14 years. But how is this all going to play out as thousands of years in this period of time? Well, it's because it's all typologies. Things that were decades are only going to be years. Things that were centuries might be a few months or a couple of years. Things that, you know, that's the way it works. It is typologies, not exact things playing out in the exact way, in the exact times over and over and over again. It's going to be condensed. That's why Mark's discourse and why Matthew's discourse tell us that that um, it'll be a time worse than it was in human history to that point, and then Matthew's is even worse, right? One is mid-seals, one is mid-trumpets. So we know these things get intensified into a shorter period of time. Yet, there still must be a connection to 70 because it's given to us all throughout Scripture. All right, so I wanted to give you kind of little, a little warm-up to that because, man, it, it's it's digging, it's deep, it's a little bit intense, it, it, it fries your brain a little bit. But as you watch, as you follow along, if you need to pause, rewind, go grab a coffee, take a break. I've been doing this for hours, for the last couple of days, but especially intense into it today. And I thought I had it, and then it was slipping my mind, and then, then I got back in, and then I spent the time, because a lot of times... I'll just spend my time in my garage. I'm sitting in a chair, you know, and I'm just chilling. I've got my phone. I'm in thought and I'm going through scriptures and I'm pondering these things. And, you know, I know where the scriptures are and all these things. And I can just bounce back and forth in my thoughts. And, and then I've got it. And then I go to my laptop and I'm playing and putting all these things together. And, you know, all in prayer as well. Right. Lord, lead me. Spirit, open the understanding. Let me see it. Speak through me. Right. Help bring those to see it and to understand it. And as I did, and as it started coming together, I was like, oh, maybe there's a reason why there's a 70 that starts it and a 70 that ends it, you see? Because the 70 that ends it is clearly not the reference 70 that would begin the 14 years. Because what do we know? It begins with their captivity. And it ends with the enemy's destruction. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. All right. So with that, guys, um, I also wanted to put out there 
uh, for my daughter. My daughter, my my wife uh, took my daughter to the hospital here tonight. Um, they've been there waiting in the ER for a couple hours. I think they got another hour or so they've got to wait. She just has uh, an infection. We, we've tried uh, with the doctor that she's been on antibiotics three times for it over the last couple of months or so, and nothing has worked. So she's gone to the hospital to, to see if it can get fixed up, to see what they can do. And uh, so your prayers would be greatly appreciated. My daughter's name is Elena, by the way. Pretty cool, right? It was, uh, just so you guys know, anybody that's new, my daughter, so my son's name is Ocean. And, you know, we thought like the depths of the ocean, the power, the calmness, the peace, you know, so it was a really cool name. And if he was ever teased as he got older, you know, or when he was younger, he could always use his middle name, William, and they could have called him Will. But Ocean, everybody loved it. Everybody calls him O, Ocean. And uh, my daughter, her name is Elena, and it was my wife's idea to name her after me. So my name is the French Allen, A-L-A-I-N. So her name is A-L-A-I-N-A. -A -A. So her name is Elena, and her middle name is after my wife. So my wife's name is Winnie. Everybody calls her Win. So we named our daughter's middle name Win. So she's named after dad and after mom. So that was pretty cool. So if you guys can please add her to your prayers that uh, this will all go away, that, that she'll be blessed and her body will all be better, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. So with that, um, I'm not going to spend too much time in, in the opening, um, but I do have to have to cover it. Because it appears we've at least still got a little bit of time. Like I said, we're going to cover the harvest as well. But it appears we still have a little bit of time. So anybody that's new to the ministry, and you hear me talking about things like 14 years, or who the Gospels are speaking to, to everybody that's new, it completely throws them off. All right? They say, oh, this guy's a nut job. You know, 14 years, there's no such thing as 14 years. And I promise you, it's all true. And there's two places you can begin to learn these things. You can come to this playlist, the Revealed End Time Study Note series playlist, Usually and, and watch these four videos right here. Just start with these four videos. These four videos are the intro. This first one right here is a 22-minute intro to the other three videos below it. It'll give you the overview, what what brief insights revealed who the Gospels are speaking to, which is the first 30-minute Bible study that follows it, you're going to see incredible things like, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end of days is Luke, Mark, Matthew. It's the Synoptic Gospels. And what people have never understood is these contradictions that appear to be within the Gospels. You know, your churches will have told you, well, it's just perspective. But perspective doesn't fit, you see? If you read the story, for example, of Jesus going to the cross, in Luke, he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful. In Mark, he was arrayed in purple, and in Matthew, he was arrayed in scarlet. Well, these people weren't colorblind. You know, the, they were witnesses, and they, they, Luke heard from the witnesses that were there, and yet, why would there be three different colors? You see, we've asked several pastors around the world that people have spoken to uh, throughout this ministry, and I never heard of one pastor that even realized there were different colors of robes in Mark and Luke. Pretty crazy, right? So what would be the purpose for these colors? How, do you, how can you explain these different colors? You know, why in Luke on the cross did Jesus say, Father, into your arms I commend my spirit, but in Mark and in Matthew, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And forsaken means to leave behind. Did Jesus think he was being left behind? No, of course not. Well, why didn't Luke also say that if they were supposed to be his last words? You see, because Luke is the typology, is the representation within his word, is the representation of the bride of Christ, arrayed in a gorgeous, white, beautiful robe. Into your arms I commend my spirit. What is purple and scarlet? Those are tribulation colors, right? The woman that rides the beast arrayed in purple and scarlet. And then you got Mark and Matthew. Jesus was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Who are the two that are left behind then? Mark and Matthew. And Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, in Mark and Matthew, why have you forsaken me? Which means leave me behind. You see, these are the little things. And those are just the little tidbits that you'll start to get introduced to in the first one. 
And then in the 30 minute Bible study of it, you, it'll go deeper, but it's still just the beginning. From that, you're gonna realize that there's not just one set of seven years, but there are two sets of seven years. And what you're gonna understand within this, and in fact, there's actually a 50 day portion, which represents Luke's portion, that is before the 14 years of seven of seals, seven of trumpets. But this third or this fourth video, the big one, it's all because of Matthew, is the one that will connect all of those dots after you begin to understand these things. What you're gonna see from it's all because of Matthew is because everybody for hundreds and hundreds of years have been taught the gospels through the lens of the gospel of Matthew. So when your foundation is based in Matthew, everything else you see, you try to unknowingly, even though you're not aware of it, you're trying to associate it through the lens you've been given of Matthew. And when you're searching and seeking prophecy, which is what we do, this is the revelation of the open books, the prophecy being revealed from the beginning of creation to the end of revelation. And what you're gonna see is if everything you do goes to Matthew 24, you'll realize as you go into these things here, why Matthew knowingly is written to the Jews. You see, Mark is written to the world, to the church, to, to the house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in, whereas Luke is written to the bride. So what happens is because everything you've done is in Matthew, everything you see tries to connect to the seven years that are Matthew's seven years of trumpets, you see? Marks. That's why the discourses are different. Luke's is very different because it relates to a 40, 50 day period of time, whereas Mark's relates to the seven years of seals, at which point Matthew will be removed from Jerusalem. They're going to be destroyed at the beginning of the 14 years. And for those first seven years, they're going to be removed from the land. And it'll be World War III, the beast, the false prophet until the Lord comes on Mount Zion at the end of the sixth seal and all this stuff takes place. And then trumpets begins, the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple before the pit is open, antichrist is there, Satan, false prophet, because Satan's been cast down and it'll go to the end of the seventh year of trumpets and the Lord then returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. It sounds unbelievable if you haven't understood these things, but what you will have noticed is that Everything you just heard me say, you've known to some extent. But what has happened is because everybody's foundation is in seven years, they've mashed it all. This process that will take 14 years is mashed into seven. That's why everybody is so confused. And once you go into these, then you can come to see that pre, mid, and post are all true. Luke's is pre, Mark is mid, and Matthew's is post. Luke's is the pre-trib bride of Christ. Mark's is the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. That's why it's between the end of the sixth seal and the seventh seal in Revelation chapter seven. And then of course, at the seventh trumpet, the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. You can go into the discourses revealed. Once you understand some of these beginning ones, this is going to blow your mind. You could see the coming tribulation seen as never before. We go from Revelation 6 to 14, lay out the seals and trumpets. I mean, you can go through all of these things. It is absolutely awesome. And what you can do in saying this is you can either do it from the playlist here on the YouTube channel, or you can go to ministryrevealed.com. This is the intro page. You can go here to the menu box, you see, to the menu, and you can click on all these places here. So this is the intro and that's what you were seeing here. Oops, I went back to home. So if we go to the intro, you'll see the same type of thing here. Here's the intro video, video one, video two, the big one, and then when you wanna go deeper. This goes heavily into the revelation of the gospels. This is about three hours long, okay? Then there's your discourse is revealed, pre, mid, post, okay? The seven churches revealed. This is an awesome one about the mystery of the use of a comma in the, in the word and, the open books, and then this one here that takes it all the way back to the beginning. You're gonna see that the entire story that plays out from beginning to end 
is a huge fractal of creation. So fractal, the thousands of years from creation to the end are the years that play out in the end of days. It's absolutely incredible. All right. So that's for those who are newer. And of course, oh, I already took down the website. On the website as well, which you could link from right here, you can join us in the forum. So in the menu box, there's the word forum. You can click on there. There's 11, 1,200 people from around the world. We're posting uh, prayer requests and news and events and uh, uh, things going on around the world and, and, and Bible studies and all sorts of things going on in there. And we've got, uh, you can support us here with GoFundMe or PayPal or also from our website. And if you go to the website at ministryrevealed.com, You'll see the ministry that we support over in Uganda. Um, it, guys, it's going crazy. It is exploding. Our brother Steve and his team over in Uganda, uh, they're traveling every week. They're going through different parts of Uganda into the Congo. They're preaching. They're bringing Bibles. And those that have Bibles, they're bringing our ministry revealed book. And he's, he sent me a message uh, just the other day. He's saying, we can't keep up with the books. You see, Ministry Revealed has a book, and you could see it on the uh, Ministry Revealed website. You can read it from the website. You can download the book in PDF, and you can um, also buy it if you wanted to from Amazon. That's what this is here. This is from the book, okay? This is the book right here. And what happens is in Uganda, I don't know how many of them have phones because it was a great idea to maybe have some of them read from phones, But to be able to make notes in the margins and to do all that other stuff, they can't do. And what they want is they've been eating this up like crazy. You see, many of them have had Bibles for a while. Many of them, like all of us, have been confused and trying to understand, what is this saying? What does this mean here? What, what do you mean end times are coming? What do you mean preparing for the time of the end to be watching and praying? What does that mean in Luke's discourse? How can we do these things? What do we need to understand? And so what's happened is we've been providing through you guys, through the support of the ministry, all of these things for Steve and his team. And it's been absolutely incredible. Well, guys, he can't keep up. Could you imagine? I said, well, what do you mean you can't keep up? I mean, there's been, I think, close to 2,000 of the ministry revealed books over, what, 2,500, 3,000, I think 3,000 Bibles that have been given out. Um, the travel to the locations, the, the setup and everything else. I'm like, what do you mean you can't keep up? He says they need hundreds of ministry revealed books per week for those that already have Bibles. They also need Bibles. The Bibles come first. But the ministry revealed books for those that have Bibles and have been studying for years are seeking the books to help them better understand and prepare for this time to come. And... He says they need hundreds of them a week now. How crazy is that? Man, you would have asked me, if you asked me five and a half years ago when I got this really going and I was doing this and I realized something was happening, man, oh man, I would have thought, man, you are crazy. You're crazy, there's no way. Well, brothers and sisters, it's happening. We're preparing and it looks like we still have a little bit time this year, all right? We know this count that we're in. We're gonna talk about it here but there's a little bit more time. So if we can continue to provide and help every way we can, let's continue to do it, all right? So where did I want to go? Oh, let me show you this now. So our, sis uh, our sister, um, Trisha, had a really good uh, message that she sent me and she posted it in the forum as well. And I thought it was really, I thought it was very interesting because you see, the the, The, the thought lately, just recently, as we'd gone into Ruth and so forth, was this possibility that the great, uh, sorry, that the pre-trib bride of Christ, that Luke group, is potentially the main harvest, right? The end of the barley harvest. And that the workers would actually be either they're a portion of that or because they're the first fruits of the wheat, that they would be the first fruits of the wheat harvest. So Christ was the first fruits for the barley, the preacher of barley goes, and then these guys will receive the light, as we know, from Christ, right? They're going to be with them for 40 days, and 
they're going to be the first fruits of the wheat harvest to bring in the wheat harvest. All right. And so as as I've contemplated this in, in the last couple of videos and and been digging into it, I thought this was really interesting. But you have to know at the same time, the, the time is running short. You see, the time is running short for it to be barley. And you'll see what I mean, but there's still time, okay? But this is what she posted and, uh, and what she had sent to me in relation to Christ and him going to the cross and so forth. She felt led as the Spirit, and she was pondering these things years ago, that the, that the Lord had led her to understand that, you see, there were th you can say there were three portions, if you will, to what happened to Christ going to the cross, okay? He was what? betrayed so we're in john 18 and we know it started off with jesus being betrayed the next thing that happens is jesus is scourged okay let, let me show you let's go into john 19 and show you this wording for scourged so we know betrayed the second one is he was scourged right he was flogged okay he was beaten and what was the third one? They wanted to crucify him, and of course they crucified him. So there were three things. He was betrayed, okay? A betrayal is something that kind of happens to all of us, doesn't it? At some point in our lives, we've experienced some sort of betrayal and so forth. So this betrayal is, is something quote unquote, yes, it could be painful, it can hurt, but, but, you know, is it overall really big? Yes, it, it could be a big deal, especially in Christ's case, right? But the betrayal was, was the lighter thing. So if you look at it as barley, wheat, and grapes, you look at the barley and the husk, right, of the barley, it comes off, right? It gets thrown into the air and they winnow it and the barley, right, it separates and it falls to the ground. So it doesn't take a lot of, of, of tribulation, a lot of beat down or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So it's as if the betrayal was the light portion. Even though, yes, inside it, it, it hurts a lot, right? Of course, as it would have hurt Jesus. But then the second thing was the scourging, right? The beating that he took. So the floggings that he took. And when you consider that to the wheat, and you consider that, the main wheat harvest, which is the great multitude rapture, they're going to be going through the tribulation of seals, right? Because the, the wheat gets beat on a tribulum, okay? That's where the word actually tribulation comes from, this tribulum that they would beat the wheat on to separate it because the, the husk of the wheat is harder to separate than the barley one, you see? And the pre-trib bride, the bride of Christ who's going pre-trib, She's not going to experience that beating. She's going to be what? Like thrown into the air. She's going to go up into the air and her quote unquote, her flesh is going to come off and she's gone in spirit, right? So you can see this typology to the bride actually being that, that main harvest of the barley, if you will. Because what you're going to see and what we discussed briefly on the last one is, is that the, the end of the barley, uh, of the winter, we have to be specific, okay? There is a winter barley and there is a winter wheat. There is a spring barley and a spring wheat, okay? We're talking about fall planted barley and fall planted wheat, and it, that's important to remember. So this fall planted barley, it finishes its, its harvest time in around now. Right around this time, give or take, a little bit earlier, a little bit later, we're, we're in that realm of the end of the barley harvest. And you, under, you have to understand that's important when we saw the conversation with, with um, Ruth, who is that Gentile bride, and she was given you know, her veil of barley. So the question was, was that veil of barley did it happen at the end also of the wheat harvest? Was, was the wheat already starting to be brought in? And that's where the question lies, right? So it, it, it's either going to be the bride is 
the barley and the typology of throwing lightly into the air and, and not needing the tribulum and so forth, it makes sense. But for that to make sense, it's got to be very, very soon. It could still go a little bit further, but not really. You know, it can it could still go into July and I'm going to show you guys. So when you then look at the wheat and you look at the scourging the, that, that the wheat takes at, for the tribulum, which is the word for tribulation, is the mark group, that portion of seals. But the first fruits of the wheat, the ones that are like Christ, right? The ones that will work and, and be that portion of Christ that followed him for 40 days and will carry that light during the time of seals, that isn't the same as, you know, as, as those going through seals that are going to take the beating. But you got to remember, are these guys going to take a beating? Yes, they are. Right. The first fruits of the wheat harvest, these guys are going to work. They are the workers. They're the Priscilla's. They're the Aquila's. You see, but we also have to understand is they're not, quote unquote, the same type of wheat. You're going to understand what I'm talking about. They're not the same kind of wheat. <clears throat> OK, they're this this pre-trib, this this first fruits wheat. And it relates to the winter wheat. And the winter wheat and the barley, when the barley comes to an end, it's right around the time that the winter wheat harvest is starting. The, the winter barley starts first. As it's coming to an end, the, the winter wheat is now being harvested. And you see, we saw that, that um, uh, Ruth was also there until the end of the wheat harvest as well. But when we shared it in the last video, we saw that Ruth within that was given this barley and you'd say, well, there was no wheat there. Well, I'm going to show you that there actually was wheat there. But before I do, I wanted to let you guys know, too, to finish the story is then you have the grapes, right? So you had the barley thrown up in the air, the betrayal. You have the the wheat with the scourging, with the tribulum that gets beaten on, that goes through the seals, okay? And then what happened to Jesus? He was crucified. So what happened? He had nails, right, put through his hands and through his feet. So his body, right, his, it, it was pierced. What do you have to do with grapes? Grapes have to be pierced, right? They have to be crushed. They have to be pierced. And, of course, the juice, the blood comes out of it. So you have this typology of barley, wheat, and grapes in the story of the betrayal, the, the scourging or the flogging, and the piercing having been put on the cross for the crucifixion. So the thing with this, though, to, to, to understand, and I found that very, very interesting, but what we have to understand <clears throat> is the season of barley, okay? Some people might say, well, no, maybe it's spring barley. Maybe, maybe the real connection is, is the spring-planted barley, and that's what we should be looking at, and the spring-planted wheat. No, it's absolutely 100% not what we should be looking at because, you see, the only way that you can bring in a sheaf of wet barley, right, that still has some moisture in it to bring in for the wave of the sheaf offering at the time of, of resurrection is if it was winter barley. You see, because if you plant in the spring and you plant barley in the spring, there's no way at Passover it's already grown, you know, several inches, you know, what is it, a foot, 18 inches tall, and you're already able to go grab that barley and, and chop it in. You can't do that on time. You see, it's the evidence in it that it had to be winter barley. Okay, so planted in late fall, and harvested in throughout the spring. Well, let me show you some of these. This is winter, uh, sorry, this is, yeah, winter or what they call fall barley. Okay, this is the most active when it's planted. This is all across the U.S. So you got to remember, even the Mediterranean, when it comes to like those central states in the U.S., it's still very much Mediterranean-like. So you can get the typology. You can see when they plant. It's mainly October, okay? It can end from October, even a little bit into November. And here's the harvesting dates. So here's the harvesting dates of fall barley or what's called winter barley. 
this is where they're most active in their harvest. And right here is the end of the barley harvest. So you've got July 1st, August 15th, July 3rd, July, one in June, July, that's a late one, August 25th, June 14th, July 25th, July, August, July, July, July. Okay, the vast majority of them are July. Okay, early, mid-ish, even a little bit to the late, and you've even got one, two, three of them that are in August. So is it possible, is it possible that where we are now, that there's some other connection we're trying to understand that's still barley? Is it possible to the end of the barley harvest is the pre-trib escape? Is it possible that that barley can actually go to towards the end of July? I just showed it to you. See, you've got some in July. There's a late July. There's August, right? There's a midish July. There's a late July, midish July, uh, early August, midish July, midish July. So could it be a mid July to early August time frame? You see, it still can be which means it still could be possible that in this count that we've shared that started from the 16th of Sivan in Taurus, because what was the key in this? The beginning as the end. What is the month of Sivan? The month of Sivan is Taurus. In the beginning of creation in Genesis 1, it was Taurus. And in the beginning means the Feast of first fruits which is the 16th day of the first month. The 16th day of the first month in creation was Taurus, the 16th day, which is now called Savan the third month because of what the sun has done over the, over the thousands of years. Okay, so if in the beginning is where the end is and the end is in the beginning, and we've shared on these things, the last shall be first, the first shall be last, all of these things tie into it, then this is why we've been counting from here, from right here. So what did we get for our seven Sabbaths? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Sabbaths, and then this begins the 50th day. So what would this mean right here? This right here could be connected to barley as the pre-trib escape, and then what do we know happens? When the Lord returns on the eighth day, after seven days on the eighth day, it would be what? This overlapping time, right? This period where, bar where wheat is also being harvested. But it's not the end of the, of the wheat harvest. Do you understand that? It's still not the end of the wheat harvest. You see, let me show you the wheat one. This is wheat. So this is from the same chart, but this is what they call winter wheat. Again, it's just like the, the fall or uh, winter barley, okay? And you could see when it's most actively planted, and these are the harvest dates. There's the most active harvest dates. It's very similar, but it is always later than barley. Always later than barley. So you see a lot of July. And it turns out in, in the in the winter wheat, which a lot more wheat is planted, and this was back from 96, that there's a lot more wheat. So out of the 42 states listed here, 33 of the 42 states are July to August. They're July to August. Pretty darn close, right? Look at how many of them are August, okay? There's a lot more August, even a couple of them within here that go to September. So what's the point? The point is that you're seeing it clearly goes later than the barley. And what are we looking for? Barley can go to about this time for the latest time of the barley harvest. But then what do we know about the wheat? Okay. What, do we, what happens from this point? Well, then there's 50 days, right? Then there's 50 days. This is the 50-day count to Pentecost, right? We go to Pentecost, and 
it brings us to right here, the 50th day. And this is what we shared in the previous video. It kind of seems outrageous that, that Pentecost is actually taking us to the second, third week of, of um, September. But if you remember, look at what we shared with the loaf mistake. You see, they bring in, they bring in loaves of bread made from the new wheat crop uh, to the church for a blessing, making loaves from the grain collected at harvest. When did they bring it in? For hundreds of years they were doing this at or around August 1st. Okay, in many parts of England, we covered this in the last one. They called it, and some of them they call it the Feast of First Fruits. Well, we know it's not the Feast of First Fruits because the Feast of First Fruits is, is the one for barley. They weren't making barley, you see. They were making bread from the wheat that was brought in. You following? They even say it was from the wheat. But for hundreds of years, they were doing this. And when were they bringing it in? At or right before August 1st. So it's strange that we have that connection. And then we also shared about the wine, right? The wine harvest. The harvest season of wine, of grapes, is from August to October. It's from August to October. There is no way anywhere in a grape harvest season that you can get new wine where the church is telling us all the way back here in May is Pentecost. It's absolutely impossible. The grapes haven't even started to grow yet. You see, they've got to go through summer. So it's anywhere from late August through September to early-ish October. Where's the bulk of it? September. Just so happens, the 50th day ends at mid-September. You see, the only way this happens, though, is by counting at from the Lord God's in the beginning. In the beginning, the end, the end is in the beginning. That's the only way we get there. But you see, then the other part of the question is, well, how on earth could we get there if barley was all the way back here, right? And as we shared in the last video, when this barley wave brought, is brought in, that is just simply the first fruits. You see, that is just the beginning. It's barely even starting to, to uh, reap the harvest. And the harvest isn't done till sometime in here. And this is why I say it might even be stretching it, calling this the end of barley. And if that's the case, then Jesus did already fulfill the barley. Those who resurrected at that time were the fulfillment of the barley. Okay, but it's still quite possible, especially when we see the way this is all lined up. Okay, so let's go have a look at this. Watch this. Let me show you this. If you recall, in Ruth chapter 2, it says, So she kept close with the maidens of Boaz to glean to the end of the barley and of wheat harvest. Okay, when we came into Ruth chapter 3, we saw that it said in verse 2, Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. That doesn't mean he's threshing it. He's in the room, the barn of the threshing floor, and he's winnowing barley. Okay? As we come down and read, she's told, right, to go lie down at his feet, you know, wait till after he's eaten and he's had a couple drinks, right? We read that in verse 7. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. He went to lie down at the end of heap of corn. Well, hold on a second. We never caught that last time, right? We might have read it before, but everybody knows that there wasn't corn back then. Okay? So if we go to Ruth, actually, we can go to Ruth chapter 3. And then I'm going to show you this. You see, with a heap of corn, okay? It means a sheaf. A sheaf, that also means a pile. 
to pile up. But is it really quote unquote corn? No, what you're going to see is that corn doesn't mean corn. They could tell you, I mean, you'll find studies that say it means grains, right? Any grain that's standing up, but it's not true. In all of the cases, when you see this in relation to corn, you're going to see the actual definition of it. Check this out. Okay, here's that heap or heap of corn or sheaves. Look at where we find one of them. Let's go to Song of Songs, okay? Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 3. Let's go it in our trusted e sword. 7, verse 3. Listen to this. Uh, actually, in verse 2. Thy navel is like a round goblet, which wanteth no liquor. Thy belly is like an heap. There it is, okay? Like a heap of wheat like a heap of wheat, okay? Like a stalk of wheat. There we're seeing this wheat connection to corn. Well, there's even more. Check this one out. We don't need to go there for this one. Watch this one. You guys probably know this one well, right? In um, John chapter 12. In fact, in John chapter 12, we covered this not too long ago. And what this is about is Right here, in chapter 12, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. What is this corn of wheat? Okay, let's go into John chapter 12. We know that John chapter 12 relates to the time of seals, right? This portion of around middish seals. See, and if a corn of wheat, there it is right there. And if a corn of wheat, okay? There's the kernel, a seed of grain. There it is again to tell us that it's corn, wheat, right there, okay? What do we know about, <clears throat> excuse me, this wheat? Well, we know that relates to those who are putting their necks on the line during seals, right? So isn't it fitting that those who have the light of Christ are putting their necks on the line as Christ did, right? As John did, and they're working during the time of seals to bring in what? The great multitude of the wheat harvest. You see? So that would explain this wheat first fruits, wheat workers. You see, in the past, when I would break this down, it would appear <coughs> like, like the, the, the first fruits. And this is where it was kind of a head scratcher before because if everybody going pre-trib is, is the pre-trib of wheat, how, how is it distinguished that portion that comes out of the wheat? Okay, that, that remains to work. So we're starting to see some understanding in relation to the the barley piece coming first but that barley piece is the time is running short right it's getting really tight so is it still possible though that they can be wheat and that the pre-trib is all wheat and a group is taken from them yes that is very possible and you'll see that even in things like um is it in this one yeah so when it comes to the levites remember the levites don't inherit any of the land, okay? They don't get the land. They're, they belong to the Lord, right? He is theirs. And so in Numbers 18, 26 and 27, it says, Thus speak unto the Levites and say unto them, When you take of the children of Israel the tithes, the tithes which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then shall you offer up and heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. You see, so from of those that could be the pre-trib of the wheat, a portion of them is to remain as that workers of seals, as that first fruits of that wheat harvest. Okay, now you, now you can see that. That's why when we looked at this, in relation to, to loaf day, right, which is when they bring in uh, the loaves of bread as the first fruits of the wheat harvest, 
it's between uh, August 1st or it said shortly before. So here we are at this connection that would bring in the loaves of bread, which means the pre-trib escape happens. These guys then are the first fruits and the Lord, when he returns on the eighth day, we know when he returns on the eighth day, he meets with them, they follow him and so on and so forth. We know the story. Those are the actual workers. Those are the, the ones putting their necks on the line. They are truly the first fruits of the first fruits of the weed harvest. But as you just saw, as you just saw in Numbers 18, we can see that the first fruits, the 10% tenth, tenth that is going into them, from that, there's another portion of it that is theirs. And listen to what it says in verse 27. So uh, this is Numbers 18, verse 27. And this, your heave offering, shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the threshing floor and the fullness of the wine press. Well, isn't that interesting? Because we know there are two worker groups during the time of seals and then trumpets. One is wheat and the other one is grapes. One are the seals workers, the other one are the trumpets workers. One is wheat, one is grapes. Okay, let's look at it in Esword, Numbers 18, 27. Okay, here it is right here. And this your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn. Ah, oh, look at that. That is grain, corn, flour, ah, wheat. You see, so what we're noticing with the word corn is that no point within corn is it telling us barley. It's telling you wheat, 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 wheat. And in some places where it says corn, it just means standing grain, the grain that's standing tall. Well, if every other piece is telling you that corn is wheat, why would we suddenly turn to think that it means barley? Okay, you'll see why I'm leading you in this. Okay, let's, let's keep going to the next piece. What about Joel chapter 2? This is a great one. In fact, there's going to be pieces in this you're going to want to remember, like this right here. See, in Joel chapter 2, what do we know about Joel? In the book of Joel, we broke down the book of Joel, chapter 1, 2, 3, right? Remember we did pre, mid, post? So in, in the open books, we've done chapters to years, right? Where in the book of Joel, it's not chapters to years, it's, it's, um, it's chapters to portions, right? It's a pre, mid, and post, chapter 1, 2, 3. And I don't know if, how far back it goes, but... Um, it's in here. Oh, let's see if I can find it fairly quickly. Then I will point it out to you. I don't even know if I went past it. <laughs> I don't even know exactly what it is I'm looking for. But it's around here. Come on, come on. There it is. It's called Joel in the Is to Come. That video, Joel in the Is to Come, you'll see the pre, mid, and post revealed in the book of Joel, chapter 2. So, uh, uh, actually, 1, 2, and 3. So, here we are in 2, and, and what's the connection in 2? Well, first of all, I want you to remember this. This is going to be shared when we get to the next portion. So, he says, But I will remove far off from you the northern army. Okay? Well, we know when tribulation begins, he's bringing the northern army, okay? What do we know happens at the end of seals? He's going to remove and destroy the northern army, right? We, we've taught on this. We know that it's Syria and those who are in cahoots with Syria when they bring the destruction uh, against uh, Jerusalem and it begins the 14 years. So this is the end of seals when the northern army is removed and look at what it says. Uh, Jer uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 24. And the floors shall be full of wheat. And I will restore to you the years that the locust and the canker were and the pale worm. So what does that mean? Because famine, right? Wasn't that interesting? 
when the time of the wheat, all the grain has come in, right? It's also the typology of the great multitude rapture, which is the spring wheat. Remember, I told you they were separate. It's the spring wheat. The spring wheat planted in the spring isn't ready until uh, fall. It's September in further into October. And it can't be used till the following year. As we all know, it cannot be used until the following year at Passover time, at the time of unleavened bread. Okay, That's why in the seventh chapter of Revelation, when the great multitude comes in, they didn't come in right at the end of the sixth seal. You see the 144,000 were sealed, and then there's the great multitude. That's a period of time that takes place. So the point is, though, is one, you're going to see the northern army is removed from them. The vats, right? The, the floors, I mean, are full of wheat. So the great harvest of the great multitude wheat has come in, and he's going to restore unto them the things that, that, that had caused the famine when they were destroyed and removed from the land. You see, we know that when they get destroyed and removed from the land, whether you go to Mark's discourse or you go to Matthew's, we see it right here. Right? Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines. Okay? There's going to be famine of the word, but there's actually going to be famines. Well, this is taking place right from the beginning of seals. Even Matthew, when Matthew gets destroyed, when Judah gets destroyed and they're removed, even for them, remember, it starts for them with destruction, nation against nation, and there'll be what? Famines and pestilence. You see? They're going to have famines and pestilence. What did it say in Joel chapter 2 that gets restored to them? Joel chapter 2 represents the end of seals, the Lord on heavenly Mount Zion, and you see that the floor is full, and they're going to restore the years that the army, see the great army which is sent among them, and but all these things that were destroyed which caused the famine. Which means... From when the northern army comes in, you're going to see I'm building it all in together. From when the northern army comes in, destroys them and removes them, you see, that there's going to be famine, there's going to be destruction, there's going to be all of these things. We know the one that comes from the north is Syria and those with Syria. We know when the Lord comes at the end of seals, when, he, when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion, okay? We know this is all about the end of seals. He destroys the army of the north, right? All those that come against them, they'll be restored. The great multitude rapture come in. The, the Judah comes in. And then it'll be the seven years of trumpets. They'll be rebuilding the city and the streets. All these things we've already understood and known. But you see what's here? This is when the floor of wheat is full. That doesn't happen at the beginning. It starts with the first fruits of the wheat. You see, not everybody's going that's wheat is going pre-trib. You see, because there's this spring wheat and there's, there's this winter wheat and there's this spring wheat. And we've shared on these things many times in relation to Leah and Rachel, right? The old before the new, right? The firstborn before the secondborn, before the younger one. And here we are. Check this out. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, watch this. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, uh, verse 23. Uh, let's start in verse 22. Again, this connection with ties to them, right? So it says, uh, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year, and thou shalt eat before the Lord. Does that sound familiar? And thou shalt eat this tithe, this, this first fruits of the wheat. You're going you're gonna to eat it before the Lord. Before the Lord thy God, in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. Isn't this what we're talking about at the, at, when the Lord returns from the, the banquet, uh, from the wedding and he has a banquet meal? With these workers, with this tithe priestly line workers, this remnant bride, the Priscilla's and Aquilas, he says, the tithe of thy corn 
the tithe of thy corn. Look at this. No, it's wheat. You see, you're going to see why is this important? Why would I show the, the connection with this in Deuteronomy 14? Well, look what happens when we get to 16. Let's see if I have something in 15. No, there really wasn't much in 15. Okay. Watch this in 16. Deuteronomy 16. We talked about this many times, right? This is, in Deuteronomy 16, is the revelation of the mystery of everybody talking about 717. Okay, it was going around for many, many years. We know in the Hebrew it's used twice. One is to gather, one is to pluck. Okay, and the revelation of 717 is actually playing out as 177. Okay. We know that the seven days of affliction of unleavened bread relates to the seven years of seals. We know that the seven days of booths is related to the seven years of trumpets. And the eighth is the new beginning, right? Is that jubilee year. Well, check this out with the Feast of Weeks. You see, it was shared in the forum, I think it was yesterday, and I made a little comment on it because... It really caught my attention, and this is what I posted about it. Look at what it says in Deuteronomy 16, 9. Seven weeks thou shalt number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest, as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. From when you begin to put the sickle to the corn. Hmm. When you begin to put the sickle to the what? To the corn. You see, a lot of people have seen this and studied on these things over the years. And that was, um, I think it was Torah.com or something like that, that the brother had posted. Well, when you go look at the Feast of Weeks in Leviticus, it says, from the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths. There's one thing. The other one said seven weeks. This said Sabbaths, right? Something strange seems to be going on. Shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days. And you shall offer a new meat offering, right? A new meat offering. Okay. Voluntary donation. Okay. A new meat offering. And we know it's the two wave loaves. However, it really throws people off because when you come to Deuteronomy, and you read about these three feasts to the Lord, and you get here to Deuteronomy, it's, it's actually telling you. See, the other one said, from when you bring in the sheaf of the wave offering. You see? Why would Leviticus say that you'll begin to count from when you bring in, uh, from when you bring in the sheaf of the wave offering? Well, that sheaf of the wave offering was the barley one, or so it would seem. Yet, this one is called the Feast of Weeks, and it says from when you put the sickle to the corn. What does this corn mean? See, it means a grain of stalk, something that rises. So, people would say, oh, well, well this is the same as what it's saying in Leviticus, in, in a way. Nobody's, nobody's in agreement that this is saying the exact same thing as what Leviticus is saying. And the clearest discrepancy is it's telling you that you're going to begin to count those weeks from when you begin to put the sickle to the corn. So what they'll tell you is they'll say, well, well, this still this grain, even though it's called corn, it could still be barley. Yet I just showed you in multiple places and there's even more where corn is actually referred to as wheat, not barley. In fact, None of the places where corn is used when it relates specifically to a grain, never once is it barley, it's always wheat. What? What? You see? But for them, this is the biggest issue. Thou shall begin as to put the sickle to the corn. So even if you take it the way they see it, and they say, well, this corn, it could be any form of grain, so we're going to say it's barley because it's got to line up with what we read in Leviticus. 
then it still doesn't make sense. Because in Leviticus, it says when you wave the sheaf. Not when you begin to put the sickle to the corn. So even if it was put the sickle to the barley, you're starting to count at the point that you put the sickle to the barley. Leviticus says when you bring in the sheaf and it's the time to wave it, that's when you begin to count. Those are two different times. Something's going on. Something is missing. And I would submit, from such time as thou begin to put the sickle to the corn, is because the corn is the wheat. The corn is the wheat. Every place, the corn is the wheat. So, what are we talking about? Are we talking about here? You see? Do an account from this period of time that takes us to here. And it just so happens this is the time frame for hundreds of years when this is brought in. And then you do a 50 day count from there. And this is the time when new wine is the grapes have been crushed and, and new wine is coming about. I think it's looking like it. It's making sense to me. So <clears throat> within this, we still have some time. Look at this. This is uh, Numbers 28, verse 26. Also, in the day of the first fruits. Now, for this, you see, when you don't have a program like this, ESORD, you don't have something like this at your fingertips, you miss out on these definitions, and they are extremely important to have, okay? Because you might read in your scriptures, and it says, also, in the day of the first fruits, when you bring in the new meat offering, you see, you might read this first fruits, and it doesn't tell you that it's Feast of Weeks there until later. You might think that, oh, it's, it's the first fruits from the Feast of First Fruits. No, you see, when you got the word definition, you can understand that this is the Feast of First Fruits of the Weed Harvest, okay? And in the day of the first fruits, when you bring in, see, when you bring in the new meat offering okay there's that new meat offering that voluntary donation listen to what it says unto the lord after your weeks are out after your weeks are out you see so it doesn't get brought in before so here we are talking about this with uh, Deuteronomy and seeing this sickle to the corn and realizing that corn is wheat. And when we have this count that we count from corn, which is wheat, and when the Sabbaths are out, we equal right here. This period of time is directly in line with the winter wheat harvest. Which means it may be that if still nothing happens over these next several days, few days, even going to the time of the solstice, then we're in the count of the harvesting of the wheat. You see, that means that, means that the wheat harvest has begun, okay? Barley has come to an end. The wheat harvest, there's that overlapping time, right? Barley is coming to an end, and the wheat harvest time is counted. And at the end of those seven is when the two loaves are brought in, of which the Levitical portion has their portion, which they keep from the first fruits, you see? So then you've got that first fruits, that group that goes pre-trib, and then you've got a portion of it that remains. So as much as this looked very interesting and still has a possibility of the end of, of the, of the uh, 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 barley, it's not a certainty. 
because as we've been teaching for a long time, it may be that Jesus has already, with those that resurrected, fulfilled that barley harvest. You see what I'm saying? And what we're talking about now is actually the beginning of wheat. Okay? So I'm just, that portion I was putting out there to, to help you guys see this, this time frame that we're counting to now. We understood and understand why we've started counting from here. But this 10 days off possibility, this connection, it's done. You see, we're right here today. That 10 day count is over. So there were only two options. It was either going to begin in relation to uh, uh, Taurus and the 50 day start, or within Taurus, the beginning of the year counts as it was in the beginning, Taurus, the 16th day. When we begin 16th day, Taurus, this is the start of your year. Let me remind people real quickly. When the Lord God told Moses in Exodus chapter 12 to this shall be unto you the beginning of your uh, of months. Uh, it shall be the first month of the year unto you. When Moses received this from the Lord and he was looking up, it was Taurus. Not maybe, not kind of. Everybody knows, if you go look it up, all the Jews know that, that study anyways, that it was Taurus. Okay? So we know the revelation we've received from Taurus. We know the Lord was telling them it was first month, first year. So since the third month and the connection to this third month has passed, in relation to the physical third month, based on where the calendar is, based on where the sun is now, that possibility is gone. That's done. So there's only one thing left for this year, and it's the count as it was in the beginning, as it was to Moses, as it was for the reason why the Jews started their, their uh, alphabet with Aleph, because in the beginning it was with Moses, it was started in Taurus, which is now the month of Savan. So all we're doing is we're doing the sheaf of the wave offering count from the end, you see, from the end of the harvest, which is now as it was in the beginning. When we do that, this is where the, 40, the seventh Sabbath ends, and this starts the 50 days. This, as you guys all know, is the fifth month, fasting and mourning. And this is the seventh month, fasting and mourning. The 50 days ends, and what happens? Destruction begins. The fifth and seventh month, exactly as we've been sharing throughout Scripture, it's the whole story. It's the story of, of Zechariah that we've been sharing for so long. So now, let's go into some of this stuff. In relation to Jeremiah, okay? Now that we're established, now that we've got a, a firm foundation in relation to still being in it, because we have always known there were only two options, okay? There were only two options. And you wanna talk about nerve wracking. You wanna talk about nerve wracking, guys. Do you understand if this comes and goes? Oh, sure, we might push it and say it goes to to be of, right? Because of of the Exodus story. But this is this is the end of the line for this year. I, I've said it before. There will be no other watch date in ministry revealed until then 2024 at the time of the third month. We would watch the same things we've watched that would either go from the 8th of Savan, the 15th, potentially the moon, and then to option two. So the question really is, how certain can we be that this is the 70th year? You see? That's the most important part. 
We've established the harvest. We, we, we've established that this is literally when they were bringing in the loaves. We've established that this is literally the harvesting of wine and, and the new wine celebration time, literally, not kind of, but for hundreds of years. So we're not, we're not um, you know, spitting in the wind or anything. We've known these things for years. And the main reason we followed the ninth fasting and morning uh, of the fifth month and the seventh month is because Zechariah is the one that told it to us. And it's 50 days, just as we know, needs to happen. So the real big question in all of this is, what about the 70th year? What about the 70th year? Well, hold on to your hats, because now we're going into Jeremiah 25. All right, and it's the 70 years of captivity. Well, hold on a second. What do you mean 70 years of captivity? There can't be another play on 70 years of captivity. Exactly. Exactly. They're not going into captivity again for another 70 years. You get that, right? <coughs> excuse me. You guys all understand. <coughs> excuse me. You guys have all understood what I was sharing with you guys earlier. Okay? Things that played out over decades, hundreds of years, thousands of years are going to play out over 14 years and 50 days. It's not going to play out the exact same. It's going to be in typologies. So we know there, there isn't a physical captivity for an entirety of 70 years. So let's see what we can understand from this. Jeremiah 25, verse 3. Listen to this. From the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king, uh, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is, listen to this, the 3 and 20th year. That's kind of interesting, right? That's a fun one. 2023, the 23rd year, interesting timing. It says, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but you have not hearkened. And the Lord hath sent, sorry, and the Lord hath sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, turn ye again now, everyone from his evil way and from the evil of your doings and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them and to provoke me to anger with the works of your hands and I will do you no hurt. Okay, what do we see this? <clears throat> He sent them early, he's sending them, he's sending the prophets, he's warning them. And of course, we know that they did not hearken. Verse 7, you have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families, here it is, remember I told you to remember that? Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring him against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about, okay, all round about Jerusalem and Judah, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and perpetual desolations. This doesn't sound like a big deal right now, does it? This sounds perfectly normal, doesn't it? This is exactly the type of thing we know is about to take place. All right, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 4. We've known this very, very well. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 5. Declare ye in Judah and publish in Jerusalem. In fact, look at how it starts. 
Does it say put away? Yeah, see? In Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 1. If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me. And if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then thou shalt not be removed. See? Again, they're being warned. They were being warned. They were being warned. He sent the prophets. He sent all of them for warnings. So, verse 5. Declare ye in Judah, and publish in Jerusalem, and say, Blow the trumpet in the land, cry, uh, assemble yourselves, go into the defense cities. Uh, da, 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 da. Verse 6. Set up the standard towards Zion, retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. The lion is come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He is gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy cities shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. How many times have we shared this over the years? We know this is the beginning of the 14 years at the end of the 50 days when Jerusalem is compassed about by Syria, by those with Syria from the north. They will have a smaller army and they're going to bring about great destruction. And the Jews are going to flee. They're going to be removed from the land for the next seven years you see although it said 70 we know it's not going to be 70 this time but we know it's going to be seven you see they're all playing out in typologies you see what else do we know about the line let's go to daniel let's go to daniel chapter 7. daniel 7 verse 4 the first beast is a lion Okay, we know that this lion, this first beast, the second one is a bear, the third is a leopard, the fourth is the beast, right? The Antichrist beast that, that takes over everything. So we know that this typology of what is taking place in Jeremiah that we'll end up reading says will take place for 70 years that will start in the 23rd year, funny enough. Right? All of this warning, all that he's going to do, he's bringing the family of the north, he's bringing destruction. He's going to do all these things. Bring about destruction. And then listen to what it says, Jeremiah 25, verse 10. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of the mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstone, and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But hold on a second. Okay? Again, we know they're not going to be doing this for 70 years. But do we know that those from the north are coming and are going to actually destroy them and make it a desolation? Absolutely we do. Without question we do. This is what this this is precisely what we've been teaching for years. Look at what Daniel said, right? In uh Daniel chapter 9 verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I Daniel understood the uh understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years. See, accomplish. That he would complete 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. <laughs> Just wait. You see, that he would complete. He would accomplish, right? Let's go have a look. Let's just look at the wording real quick. You know, the more we go into parts and pieces and dig and, and spend time in some of the nitty, nitty gritty. Man, look at this. To be at an end, right? To fulfill, to, to accomplish, to, to bring to an end 70 years. What on earth is, is Daniel saying that he understood by the books of Jeremiah these 70 years? Okay? He's literally talking about these 70 years that we're reading about in chapter 9. Uh, sorry, in chapter 25. 
he says that they will serve them, right? They'll be destroyed and they'll serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. But we know it can't be 70 years. And if everything that was and is was thousands of years is going to be condensed into a much shorter period of time, what do you think that condensed shorter period of time is going to be? Well, the total is only 14. But shouldn't it have an end connected to 70? Shouldn't it have some sort of end connected to 70? Just wait. You're going to see that's exactly what it has. You see, look what happens when we go to Revelation chapter 6. Where are you? Okay. In Revelation chapter 6, we see... Okay, we've, we've discussed the white horse rider. We know the white horse rider is the son of man coming for 40 days. We, that's part of the, the Luke's discourse. And then what do we know? And the, at the red horse rider, uh, verse 4, Revelation 6. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. Okay, and there was given unto him a great sword. Look at the third seal. And when he had opened the third seal, um, I heard the beast say, come and see, and behold, a black horse, and he that had on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. See that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Look at what we're seeing. We're seeing a sword given, right? Destruction is coming and famine. Wasn't that interesting? What happens when we go to the discourses? Look in Mark 13, verse 8. This is the beginning of the 14 years, right here. In um, uh, uh, Mark 13, verse 8. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be great earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines. And there shall be famines. So you can't tell me that the, the red horse rider and the black horse rider isn't connected to the tribulation part when it's nation against nation and famines. Famine, hunger. Well, it was the same thing in Matthew's discourse when they're removed from the land. Remember, when Judah's removed from the land, when Jerusalem is destroyed, the Jews have fled, some are taken into captivity. See, like that, like that Nebuchadnezzar type story, and they're taken into captivity. What ends up happening? Well, there's going to be a famine, right? It's nation against nation. Matthew 24, verse 7, nation, against na nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines. You see, this is all the beginning. And then when you go into the rest of Matthew's, it's really this conversation, the trumpets, but the first seven years, you got to remember, they're removed from the land because of an attack and a destruction, and they're going to be starving. There's going to be famines, pestilence, and all these things going on. Okay? So we're seeing this taken into captivity. Okay? When we come right here, we were looking at this. Uh, from the north is coming. Right? They're going to be taken captive. They're going to be destroyed. There's going to be famines. There's going to be pestilence. It's going to be nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Well, if you remember what happens in Zechariah chapter 8. <coughs> excuse me. Zechariah chapter 8, which we talk about, is the beginning of the seven years of trumpets. The Lord, as we've shown, is now returned. He's, he's on, uh, on heavenly Mount Zion, not feet down on the Mount of Olives type, but he's on Zion, whatever that looks like in the clouds. And we know when we get to verse 10, where it says, <clears throat> for before these days, there was no hire for man, nor hire a beast, neither was there any peace. Okay? Red horse rider, peace was removed. Neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction, for I set every man, every, all men, everyone against his neighbor. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. So clearly, <coughs> the, the, the connections to 
Zechariah, the connections to, to the beginning of the discourses, to the beginning of, of the seals at the red horse and black horse rider. These are all clearly lined up to the exact same time frame of the, those coming from the north who would destroy them. And let me show it again. If we go into, um, where is it, where is it? Second Chronicles 24, this is where we see that attack, you see, at the year's end, which would make sense now to, to the time of uh, the end of Elul, right? To the start of trumpets, right? The, the start of Tishri. And it came to pass at the year's end that the host of Syria came up against Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed them. They took the soil, uh, uh, the spoil to Damascus, right? This is that typology. This is the king of the north, uh, um, the, the king of the north, or Syria coming, right? Assad. It's the same typology of them coming. But now, now we 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 start getting some issues here, because if we go back into Zechariah chapter one. And we go to our, our famous verse 12, and it says, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these 70 years? Uh, uh, if that's the beginning of the 14 years, and the 70 is starting in chapter 1, we start to get a little bit nervous here because it said against Judah, uh, uh, Jerusalem in the cities of Judah. Well, if they got him in 1967, 70 years ends in 2037. Starts to get a little nerve-wracking. Right? But you have to remember that is when they caught that is when they captured the other side of Jerusalem okay that's why everybody wants to go back or all the 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 muslims and arabs they want them to go back to pre 1967 so that they would take everybody that they that they put into the eastern jerusalem and and all of the building that they did and say bring all your people back to west jerusalem and we're going to take over these buildings and so be it you see, because since 1967, they've been taking more and more and more of East Jerusalem and building in it and building in it and building in it. Okay? That's because they captured it in 1967. So, but the issue is, is, is that really where the count begins or is there like a, a, a duality going on? Because this is what I shared in the last video. When they came into the land in 1948 and you do the count of Leviticus as we know to do, we know that we're at the end, coming up to the very end of the 70th year from when they came into the land with the Leviticus count, planting trees and to the Lord and so forth, that this is the end of 70 years. But it said Judah and Jerusalem. Well, this line of 70 years from when they came into the land, they did have Judah. You see, they did have Judah and they did have a portion of Jerusalem. Which means this is the end of 70, but there is clearly a specific one that also speaks of Jerusalem and Judah only. But they had it. And this one is the one to equals when they add both sides. You see, there is a deeper mystery that's being revealed here for the purpose of there being two 70s. I love the way the spirit works. It is, it's not easy. <laughs> I can tell you, I've lost more hair. I, I'm, I'm more stressed. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't um, uh, uh, you know, be concerned or worry about these things, right? But in, in the discernment, in the working through it, and having some hindsight, whether it's just a few days or a few weeks or months, it, it really helps because you see, this, all of this and this connection between the 14 and the 270s, 
is only something recently in this past year that we've been able to discern and put together because this Shemitah year chart of the Sabbaths all the way back to the birth of Christ is every piece is in order. The, the Leviticus count and it started a new Shemitah cycle. The when they captured Jerusalem and it started a new Shemitah cycle, we didn't make it equal this. This is what it equaled when we understood the counts properly of the final two sevens and just simply counted the Shemitah cycles back in their sevens. That's all we did. Everything landed in order and there was 14 years between that just this year, over the past few months, couple months, that everything went click. And the number one piece, that one of the key pieces was to understand when Jesus began to be 30, isn't when he turned 30, but when he completed 29, which means that's when the day after you turn your 29th birthday, the following day you're in your 30th year, you began to be 30. So it was right in that time frame. It doesn't mean it was right on day one. It just says that he began to be about 30. So he was in the early days of having turned 30. Okay, which is an interesting side note. And the reason, let me, let me, I'll jump back to this in a second. You want to know why it's an interesting side note? Because this right here in Luke chapter three, when Jesus goes to be baptized, is where we get Jesus began to be about 30. Meaning he, he had completed 29 years and he was somewhere early in the start of his 30th year. It wasn't exactly on his birthday. All right. It wasn't exactly on his birthday because it says when he began to be. So he began to be about 30, meaning it wasn't at 29. It was sometime a little bit after having completed 29. Why is this important? Because Luke chapter three is, of course, Jesus gets baptized and then he's going out into the wilderness. Right. He's going to go out into the wilderness for 40 days. So if you follow it in the is, not in our end time eyes is to come, but if you follow it into the is, that takes you to Mark chapter one. And in Mark chapter one, this is when Jesus, having been baptized, is then what? Gone to be tempted, right, by Satan and uh, Satan takes, you know, he's tempted and so forth for the 40 days. What do we know about the is to come? We know that these 40 days that we're looking for that we say are connected to the time of his birth. Well, Luke chapter three connected to Mark chapter one isn't directly connected exactly at the time of his birth. You understand why I'm bringing this up? Because one of the issues we're, we were looking at here is that if this is the time or was supposed to be the time of Jesus's birth, whether the solstice or the 15th, we're not gonna have that anymore. You see, is there a way to explain why isn't it connected to his birth? Well, I believe there is. Because if he began to be, so he was already into his 30th year, just a little bit. And Luke chapter three is Mark chapter one after he's been baptized and now he's taken in the wilderness. That means that this 40 days and this Mark gospel that we have shown the reason why Mark's gospel starts with this in the 40 days of the Son of Man is the typology of the 40 days of the Son of Man before he then what? You see, the 40 days of the Son of Man chooses his disciples, and it's the typology of the tribulation beginning, which begins in Mark as the seven years of seals. But what else do we have? Let me show you this, and then we'll get back to that other piece. If you remember in Isaiah chapter 9 that I love going to, we see the first, right? This is the light affliction that's coming to them at the start of the 50 days. They walk in darkness and it says, unto us a child is born. Well, of course I see this and I say, well, geez, it's connected to his birth. But Mark one wasn't exactly at his birth and Luke three, which are connected, aren't exactly at his birth. Does this have to be directly connected to his birth? Well, it doesn't seem so. Because where this was fulfilled in the is when he was here is found in Matthew chapter 4. Listen to what it says. Start in verse 12. 
Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the east coast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, by way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Galilees, uh, uh, sorry, of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region of the shadow of death, light is sprung up. You see? From that time, Jesus began to preach. Ah, you see that? From this time, Jesus began to preach. What is, what's the other picture of this, guys? The other picture of this is showing that what? When Jesus, John went into, into prison, was this at his, Jesus' birth? Was it connected to his birth when John went into prison? Guess what? No, it wasn't. Remember what we've taught on this? Remember what we taught? That when John went into prison, it was about... Are you listening to me? It was about approximately two months before John was cast in prison. Because then John was in prison for about 10 months. The total was a year. And then that's when Jesus, everybody turned to Jesus because then John was beheaded. Do you see what this is telling us? I just caught this now as I was reading it. You see, when Jesus heard that John was cast into prison, let me highlight that. When Jesus heard that John was cast into prison, this is a big deal right here, brothers and sisters. Because John was cast in prison approximately two months after Jesus was baptized. Hello. And this is the story of the fulfillment in the is, and there's a typology in the is to come, but in the is, is the fulfillment of this. When he showed up, was it Jesus' birthday? No. He was about 40 days and two months, right? It, the total was about two months. Are you listening? It just dawned on me as I was reading it. So guess what? If this is Jesus' birthday, and we're looking for about two months, can you say hello? <laughs> let me just let that sink in. If this is Jesus' birthday, as we've shown, gone through history, all the, the people that have shared on it and everything else, that Jesus was born here. And John wasn't put in prison till about two months later. This is two months. This is about, isn't it? Oh my goodness. The fulfillment wasn't at, directly at his birthday. The fulfillment was about his birthday when he began to be about 30, which is approximately two months into having completed 29 years. He was about two months into his 30th year. Oh man, that's awesome. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Did you see that? Rewind if you need to. The light affliction comes. Jesus at his birthday, right? Oh my goodness. No, it is two months. It is two months. 
because this is Jesus's birthday. And this is Jesus's birthday. Jesus isn't coming to start his 40 days here. He's coming here. Holy crap. That would be two months. That would be two months. We've been teaching for years that it was approximately two months before John went to prison. And then he was in prison for 10 days. And it's, there's documents, there's people that have studied it that say John was in prison for about 10 months. It's the entire storyline we've been telling you that the, the seventh year of seals is the typology of that year before he starts his about three and a half years of trumpets to complete his 70 years, uh, his seven years, which will fulfill his first year and his three and a half approximately when he was here. And then his first year and three and a half when he was here, which will fulfill, fulfill seven years and nine years in total. Both mean complete. One is a completion. One has a spiritual completion. Oh, man. Not kind of two months, two months. Oh man, I don't have to worry about making myself a note on that one. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Oh my goodness, what a relief. What a breather. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Back to where I was. <laughs> That was a good side note, guys. Okay, so back in Zechariah 1, you see, as you see what's about to transpire here in Zechariah 1 with these 70 years, in Zechariah 12, you see, so the issue becomes these 70 years, and it's talking about Jerusalem and Judah. So as you're going to see, it really starts to look like it could be to the end of 70 from 1967, which would be 2037, and then the 14 years starting. But don't worry, take a deep breath. There are two sets of seven, okay? So what do we see these 70 years? We see the Lord was jealous, uh, sore displeased. Um, then he forwarded the affliction. Remember in chapter eight, he says, then the affliction came, right? I had set neighbor against neighbor. There was nobody, there was no peace for I had set everyone against his neighbor, right? It was the time of the affliction that started. Well, the other thing we have is, of course, going into Psalms. When we go into Psalms 90 and 10 that we've talked about for years as well, we know exactly that the Psalms 90 and 10 is from 70 to 80. So when 70 years is complete, the day after begins what? the 10 years to 80, right? And those 10 years are called labor and sorrow. It's tribulation, it's pain, it's travail. Then there's a soon cut off about six months. And then we fly away as the Revelation chapter 12, right? Verse 14, when they fly away on the wings of an eagle for a time and times and half a time, that's a total of one plus two plus a half, that's three and a half years. This is the story of 14 years also from the end of 70. Zechariah, same story. Chapter 1, in chapter 1, in verse 12, it's these 70 years because they're still in their 70th until that destruction comes, okay? There's going to be the light affliction, and then there's going to be the destruction by the north, right? Through the king of the north, there's going to be the modern day, uh, uh, um, um, uh, what is it, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, right? The modern day Babylon will bring the light affliction. The king of the north will come and will bring that destruction compass Jerusalem and will destroy them, okay? These are all those things that are connected to the start of 70 when we read Jeremiah. But when you look at the story here, it says when 70 is coming to an end. What the? Why would this destruction come to them at the end of 70? When it said in Jeremiah that it was the start of 70 and they would be in this captivity for 70 years. You following? 
it, it, it already gets a little wonky. Why? How, how could we go to, to Psalms 90 and 10? It goes from 70 to 80, about six months, and then three and a half years, laying out 14 years. And yet it starts at 70. Hello. There's an issue there, right? Let's go to another one. Here's another really exciting one. Another one we've shared on many times over the years. In 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 36, okay? Listen to this. Okay, reigned, we know, uh, uh, let's go down a little bit further. Okay, the king of the Chaldees, also brought to Babylon, right? It's with Nebuchadnezzar again. Jerusalem is destroyed. Okay, ver, uh, 2 Chronicles 36, 19. And they burnt the house of God and break down the wall and Jerusalem burnt and all the places thereof with fire and destroyed it all. Uh, and then that it escaped of the sword, it carried away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Okay? Again, all the warning that was given to them as well. In fact, I think if I go to this one, did I highlight the warnings? No, I think I just brought it to this. Okay, so again, you see the warnings, you see within Second Chronicles, it tells you, where are you, where are you, where are you? We'll see Jeremiah here, just so you guys know that it's the same storyline. You're going to see Jeremiah, where are you, Jeremiah? Okay, there's Nebuchadnezzar. They were warned, there he is right here, okay? Before Jeremiah, the prophet. I've got a I got a thing so I can't I can't partly highlight it and leave a piece hanging. It just drives me bananas. <laughs> so it's it's got to go from from the beginning of it to the end of it. If I leave one out, it just drives me crazy. Anyways, so you can see here's that same storyline. So we're still talking about Jeremiah, and I've shared this with you guys a lot recently, and I have over many years that there's a reason the fifth and the seventh month are so important and so explained in Zechariah when they connect to Chronicles, when they connect to Kings, when they connect to Ezra, when they connect to Daniel and Jeremiah. I mean, there is so much time spent about this 70 years, and we've gone into it, into all of these places in relation to 70 years, that there's probably a reason for us to understand the fifth and seventh month. And guess what? Now it's really, really getting exciting to make this connection to the fifth and seventh month, isn't it? I mean, two months to when he comes? The direct correlation we're looking for? Wow. Okay, so add that on top of the fact that we're talking to the fifth and seventh. You know what? Because if you remember, this is the end of the seventh Sabbath, and this is the beginning of the 50 days. What happens? The escape happens, and the 50 days begin. When the 50 days begin, what is it? It's the seven-day wedding, right? The wedding's taking place. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And look at that. It's a great day for weddings. It's the Jewish holiday for weddings. And look at this. That's the eighth day when the Lord returns, which is the two months, right? Just as I said, but what does it start with? a light affliction from Nebuchadnezzar, right? The, or, or the modern day Babylon. This attack that happens from modern day Babylon first before the North comes and destroys them, which is the attack on the fifth month, like Nebuchadnezzar, like the destruction of Jerusalem, even though this is just the light affliction to start. This is the Isaiah 9. You see what I'm saying? This is the Isaiah 9. We're now able to connect Isaiah 9 because of Matthew telling us because we knew when he was put into prison, it was about two months after Jesus came. It was about two months from his birthday. And it's right here. We've been talking about this as the first attack and this to the second attack for years. And now we know and have known for a while that it had to be a count that begins in Taurus. Option one is now gone as of last night today. All the options that were in option one are done. 
which means it's only option two. It's the only one left in the 70th year of Israel. And we've got a two-month count from his birth. Shut the front door. And it's the one that correlates. You see what I'm saying? I'm sorry, I, I had to go back to it because we've been talking about the ninth of Av and the first of Tishri, attack one, attack two, 50 days apart. We've been talking about this for so many years. And, and this understanding with this connection to his birth, I thought it had to always be directly connected to his birth, but it turns out the one that's directly connected telling us in Matthew is telling us that it was when John was taken into prison, which was about two months after Jesus' birth. That's awesome. So awesome. But you want to talk about confusing. Why did it speak as if it was his birth? My goodness. You see how the Spirit leads and how the Spirit opens as we're going, as we're digging and digging. Guys, that was massive. This was huge, huge to happen right now. So huge to happen right now. Man, okay? So again, this is all about the 70. Yet we see in Zechariah chapter one that the 70 is coming to an end and destruction is coming to them. Okay, well, what happens in 2 Chronicles 36? It's the same story, Jeremiah the prophet, and we read they're destroyed and their capture wall is taken down. Okay, uh, they escaped the sword, carried away um, da -da -da, in Babylon. So in verse 20, 2 Chronicles 36, 20, and them that had escaped from the sword carried away to Babylon where they were servants of his and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Okay? To fulfill <clears throat> the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. Okay? For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. There's that 70 years. So, okay, say 70 years, it's going to remain desolate <clears throat> before the destruction and so forth of, <clears throat> excuse me, of Babylon. Well, in this case, you see, we've been talking about these 70 years as the 70 years of Israel. But you could see that this is to fulfill the 70 years of Jeremiah. Don't you worry, we're going to go and we're going to finish a little bit more in Jeremiah 25. But so far, what we're seeing is something that's not quite lining up to the 70 years connected here. And they seem much more connected here. Because again, it was Judah and Jerusalem. But you're going to start to notice cracks in the foundation here. There, there's issues in this because when these 70 years are done, Cyrus is the one that comes on the scene. And what does Cyrus do? He makes a proclamation to allow them to go and to rebuild Jerusalem, right? In verse 23, it says, Thus saith Cyrus, the king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God given unto me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So again, Judah and Jerusalem. Okay, when we go back into, actually, when we go into Daniel chapter, nine, uh, chapter 10, look at what it says. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Again, something we've shared on many times. Why, or how is it that Daniel has Cyrus here in an end of 70 years of Jerusalem where Cyrus is coming into the picture? He is the one, by the way, as we've shared many times, he's the one that makes the decree 
that we read about in Daniel 9.24, actually in Daniel 9.25. It says, Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. What does that mean? That means we've shared on it many times, right? This entire story of Daniel here is the 14 years of tribulation. Okay, 14 years of seals and trumpets. These are the seven weeks, the seven years that they're going to be removed from the land. Okay, it, it, there's going to be a commandment, but they're not going to rebuild the city and the streets and, and the temple until after these seven years. The only thing that will get laid is the foundation. Okay, and then the three score and two weeks, the, the following about three and a half years is when Messiah is here, they're on heavenly Mount Zion. We just read in Zechariah chapter 8, you know, they're going to start to rebuild the city and the streets, but they couldn't for the time before because the Lord had brought the affliction, neighbor against neighbor, kingdom against kingdom, famine, pestilence, you see? He brought that destruction upon them. So there was no way that they can do these things. But then these three and a half, they're going to start rebuilding the city and the streets and the temple. And then at about mid-trumpets, we know Messiah is cut off. The anti Antichrist is brought back from the pit. Right? The pit is open. Satan's been cast down. There's going to be a war. They're going to, what, go after them with a flood? And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. What, what is this story here? You guys know it. Revelation chapter 12. See, they're going to go after them with a flood. That's Revelation 12, 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. See, that's about 10 and a half years in, like Psalms 90 and 10, into the place where she, uh, where she is nourished for a time, comma, and times, comma, and a half. That's one plus two plus a half. That's three and a half years. What happens at that time when she's about to fly away? It says the serpent's going to cast water as a flood to go after her. And then what is he going to do? Then he's going to make war. See, then Satan's going to make war. Satan, the Antichrist, is going to make war. For those final three and a half years, we know that this war is going to last two and a half. Okay? So we can see all of this being part of the 14 years. We, we know this entire storyline. It's not, it's not a mystery. We know that in Daniel chapter 12, that it says, uh, you know, how long in these wonders, right? How long is Satan going to have is what it's saying. And he says that it'll be for time, times and a half. There's no end here because he's only going to have two and a half years at mid trumpets to what? Scatter the power of the holy people. Then all these things will be finished. This is the end of the sixth seal, when, uh, the sixth trumpet. When the seventh trumpet is about to sound, all things will be finished. Okay? We've shared on this. We know it's all directly related to Daniel 9. We know that this, that this decree is the decree that goes out from Daniel. That is this decree to allow them to go and rebuild. We know that after the war, which lasts two and a half years, there's one more year left, which is when the Lord returns, destroys the enemy, binds Satan. We know all these things. But you notice all of them, it says what? Well, well, Second Chronicles, it was, it was the end of 70. You see? If we, if we read what it says again in Daniel 9, 2, from Jeremiah the prophet, just as Chronicles, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. It's kind of twisted, isn't it? Because how is he going to accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem if Jerusalem's not even attacked and destroyed, and they're being brought into captivity. When on earth is this going to happen? Because it's the accomplishment of 70 years. Look at what I'm saying. Even if this is the 70 years, 
they, they didn't go into captivity by Babylon all the way back here when they ca captured the land, nor in the count from 48 to 53, right? So where's this point when, when the king of Babylon uh, uh, is going to destroy them and the king of the north is going to come? We know that Assad's coming at the very start of the 14 years. And it just so happened that it said it was the 23rd year. But it said that he would accomplish 70. It's kind of twisted. Okay? That he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. When we came back down here again with Daniel, you see it says 70 years are determined. So, again, then you read this and you say, okay, well, Maybe it's that, okay, the, the 70 years of Jerusalem are what have to be accomplished, and then that means these things are going to take place before it. Okay, but remember, who's the one that makes the, the decree to go and rebuild it? It's, of course, the modern-day Cyrus, right? <laughs> it's the modern day Cyrus when? After the fulfillment, you see, to fulfill the word of the Lord by, Jer by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths for as long as she lay desolate, she kept her Sabbaths to fulfill 70 years. So, what it really seems like in Daniel 9 is that the 70 years are completed. And then, you see, the 70 years are completed, and then what happens? Well, then it's Cyrus's time. Cyrus shows up. Do you understand? The way we have that laid out is when these 70 years are completed. When these 70 years are completed. You see? Because what do we know? Cyrus is the one making the decree, which we've been talking about for years. Cyrus is the one, whoever this modern day Cyrus is going to be, is going to be the one to make this decree to allow them to go and to rebuild. What do we know happens in the seven years? The same story that happened with Cyrus. In Cyrus's time, they never rebuilt the city and the streets and the temple. All they got rebuilt in, the, in his seven years, and that portion was the foundation. Isn't that precisely what we teach? In the midst of the seventh year, the foundation is laid. But he doesn't get the temple and everything else laid during the time of seals. It's not until the Lord has returned on heavenly Mount Zion, and then trumpets begins that for the next about three and a half years of trumpets, for the first half, the city and the streets and the temple are rebuilt. But the Jeremiah one said in chapter 25, said that it was the beginning of 70 years. Said that the whole land shall be a desolation and they're going to serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. I want you to understand. I want you to follow this. Because we know that they're not going to do this for 70 years again. The typology is a shorter typology. Just wait until we carry on with this part of Jeremiah 25, 12. It's going to all start to come in to make more clear, more clear. You see, when we were in Daniel, and we know that it's Cyrus in the third year of Cyrus, you see, <laughs> we know that there's a destruction that must happen, right? to a modern-day Nebuchadnezzar Babylon. 
Do you remember I've been telling you guys there's more than one Babylon? There has to be more than one Babylon. There is more than one Babylon. Do you remember what happened with Nebuchadnezzar? Remember what happened with Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar's dream? Right? He has that dream vision and Daniel reveals it to him. See? And maketh known King Nebuchadnezzar, which shall happen in the latter days. What ends up happening? Right? He sees that the image of gold was the head, right? This image's head was of fine gold. His breasts and arms were of silver and his belly and thighs of brass? Well, who's, who's the, the, the fine silver, uh, uh, sorry, who is the uh, arms, right? The breasts and arms of silver. That's, that's media Persia. Who, who's Persia? Cyrus. Cyrus. Which means, Whoever is the representation in today's modern day as this, as this Babylon, the 70 years that ends it for them is right here. But there's still another one. You're going to see there still has to be another one. But in Daniel's vision, I mean, in Nebuchadnezzar's vision and Daniel's interpretation, the head of gold loses power right away. You could say, oh, well, he loses power here, and then the 14 years go over here. No, you're going to see it's not possible. You're going to see that it's not possible because the story that we're told of what happens to Nebuchadnezzar after 70 years would be impossible to say that it's over here. I mean, to say that it's the same Nebuchadnezzar Babylon here as it would be here. Yet we've been able to reveal and show that Nebuchadnezzar, remember the 50-day attack. Who's the first attack? It's going to be through Iran, those working with Iran, Iran, Iraq, right? That's going to be the Babylon. That needs to be, must be the first Babylon. That's the light affliction. But they're going to get destroyed. Hence, the 70-year typology and Cyrus showing up, and it's the, the, the head of gold has lost his power now, and now you've got Media Persia. You see, we need to have media Persia, if you remember, because in Daniel 10, there's Cyrus. Cyrus is the one that makes the decree after 70. And see, it talks what shall come in the latter days of thy people. And what do we know happens in Daniel chapter 10, verse 20? It says, then said he, knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee, and now will I return to fight against uh, fight with the prince of Persia, to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. Okay? It's Media Persia first, and then it's what? Greece. But Grecia, which is also connected to Arabia. Why was that important? Well, again, what was the one that came after in the vision? Okay? Then it was the belly and thighs of brass. You following? We know that the image of, of uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, of, of the image in all its parts, is all about seals. What happens at the end of seals, at the end of the sixth year of seals? The stone carved without hands that's coming is going to destroy it. <coughs> you see? Listen to what it says. Let's go to Daniel 2.35. Uh, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like chaff 
of the summer threshing floors. Hello. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain to fill the whole earth. You see, we, we know about this from Second Ezra. Here's the preacher of escape. The world is bewildered, right? They missed that day. And then nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and the seal stuff will take place. And then shall my son be revealed. And it goes on to say, uh, he said they're going to come to conquer him. This is the first sword of the Lord. We're going to talk about that in a moment. And it says in Second Ezra 1335, but he shall stand on top of Mount Zion. Okay. Verse 36, and Zion will come to be made manifest to all people, prepared and built. This is where the rapture group is going, the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. As you saw, the mountain carved without hands. Again, we have the storyline throughout Second Esdras. We've shared on it many, many times. Here's the mountain carved without hands. What is it connected to? When is it connected to? Just like the dream, the vision, when the stone sm smites it and becomes a great mountain. That is the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of the sixth year of seals. But again, it still all started with Cyrus. Or really, it started with the image of gold, which represented Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. We know that that Nebuchadnezzar, in this typology, is the one out of power right away, right? We know that this is the relation to the light affliction that comes first with a war between Iran and Israel that breaks out in a short Middle Eastern war. Then the end of the 50 days comes and bam, the second one, the second attack comes and that is the one by the north who brings about the destruction. But in, <laughs> you see the confusion though. You see how it's kind of, it's twisted in it because in Jeremiah, it was the, the end of 70 and Cyrus comes. Okay, well, that, that seems to fit with all of this. But hold on a second, because it was the start of 70 that the north came and Babylon came and a destruction happened that brought them into captivity. So if you look at it from the perspective of what Jeremiah was saying in chapter 25, it, you, you have the image of fine gold, you, you have Nebuchadnezzar and he's in power and he's there for 70 years. When we look at it in this typology from, from the image, we see that Nebuchadnezzar is gone first, and then you start to wonder, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is it at the end of 70 of Jerusalem? Or is it really to the end of this 70? You see, what we're still seeing is this lack of clarity, whether it's to the end of 70 of Israel or to the 70 of Jerusalem. Should, should everything we know, that is the 14 years here, starting from the 70 of Israel, should all of this be moved to the other side of the 70 of Jerusalem and Judah. We still don't have that clarity. You see, we're saying it's this, but we're pointing and everything after it that we've been teaching for years is, is everything that happens in the 14 years exactly as we know it. But should it be happening here or should it be happening after the 70 over here? Because 70 years, quote unquote, in the captivity, 70 years by the rule, whether it's Rothschild, whatever you want to say, whatever that Babylon typology is, would tell us that it's then there. I want you guys to really be able to see and understand that this is, this is still what it's saying. Let's go to, watch this, let's go now to Ezra. Okay? We know that, that it's Cyrus. Okay, the 70 years are complete. Cyrus now comes into the picture and it says now the first year of Cyrus. Okay, he's the one that makes the proclamation. 
when he makes the proclamation, what's going to happen? Uh, let me see where it was. Oh, yeah. So he's the one that makes the proclamation. Okay, in the first year, he's the one that made the proclamation. It brings us back to Daniel. All right, brings us back to Second Chronicles. Brings us to Jeremiah. Well, now listen to what happens. Here we are in Ezra chapter 4, uh, in Ezra chapter 3, and verse 6. It says, From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not laid. Now in the second year, okay, Zerubbabel came, and Yeshua son of Jodek to remain of the priests. Uh, let's keep going. Verse 10. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple. And we come down a little bit further. Verse 14. Because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Hello. What happens when we go to Zechariah? In Zechariah, we see in chapter 4, starting in verse 6, then. He answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Okay, O great mountain, uh, before Zerubbabel. Uh, verse 9. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. Again, something we know, right? We get to Zechariah chapter 8, and we see uh, da, 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 verse 9. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong, you that hear in these days uh, by the words of the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. And then it goes to our verse 10 that we shared a little while ago. We knew that it, it couldn't be built. The temple and everything couldn't get built during seals. Only the foundation was laid. Only during Cyrus's time, only the foundation was laid. We know in the chapters to years, that's when the foundation is laid. And we knew that they couldn't do anything else because of the affliction, because he said all men, everyone against his neighbor. And that all started these 70 years Right as it was coming to an end, they were destroyed and bang, they were removed. But it's still all connected to Cyrus. And according to that, that was after the 70. Are you starting a little bit to see what's going on? It's like they're combined together. Like there's a flow, like a connection between a 70 and a 70. Because back here in Jeremiah 25, when does the north come? At the end of 70. It's at the end of 70 for Israel, but it's at the beginning of the 14 years for the end of 70 to Jerusalem. You see, they're not about to rebuild. It's not their time of glory and hip-hop hooray and everything else. They're about to be destroyed by the line of the north who is Syria and those who are with them. The lion is the Revelation 13. Remember that? We shared it in uh, Daniel chapter 7, and we know it from Revelation 13. Revelation 13 <clears throat> is after about the first two and a half years of seals having passed. And now the beast, right, with the seven heads and ten horns, what does he have? He now has the power of the leopard that he's controlling, the power of the bear, and the lion. This is about mid-seals or about two and a half years into seals. This is when the beast who takes over all of the power of the ones from Daniel 7 that started with the lion, then was the bear, then was the leopard, they will all be in fighting. They will all be doing their thing until the Antichrist comes and he gets his power 
to continue for 42 months about the second half of seals to the end of the sixth seal. The lion is there. How on earth can the lion who's from the north, who is Syria, who we've shown is the one that brings the second attack, which is the one that, that happens 50 days later, which is the Ishmael type, which is what happens at, uh, uh, tab, uh, at the Feast of Trumpets at the end of 50 days. How on earth could it be the lion if everything of this conversation is the end of 70, which is supposed to be related to the end of 70 of Jerusalem, and yet be the beginning of 70 according to the attack of the lion that comes against them to start the 14 years. There, there has to be a typology going on here. There has to, you see, it's so, this is why I was saying my brain was hurting. It was like, and I was, I was so like, where, Lord, please, where is this all tied in? Where is this connected? How is this working with an end of 70 and yet an end of 70? There's more than one Babylon. There's more than one Babylon. So we've got like an end of 70 and the 14 years starting, but when the 14 years are done, it's still also like an end of 70 of Babylon. Now you seeing it? Did you get that? We have an end of 70, which this modern day gold head, whether it be Iran or whoever, is, is going to be destroyed as well. That's the head of gold being destroyed. To which the arms and the chest, which is going to be the declaration by modern day Cyrus to allow them to go rebuild, yet World War III and everything else will take place. Antichrist will show up, the building will stop. Till the Lord comes at the end of the sixth seal here for the seventh, trumpets begins, the rebuilding will start. Till the pit is opened two and a half years, and then the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, to which we have what? The end of another 70. But this seemed to be the one connected in all these stories to Babylon's 70 ending. Right? When we come back, I really want to repeat and make sure you're seeing this. The North is coming and Babylon to destroy the land, to take them into their land and, and to, to disperse them and scatter them about. Yet, in this story, it says that they're going to serve them for 70 years. But in the end time story, it's the end of 170, yet still in the 70 typology of this, because it's when the North is coming to destroy them. When the North destroys them, they're going to be removed, they're going to be destroyed, they're going to be scattered, and that is what we saw in 2 Chronicles 24 that we've been teaching on forever when Syria comes and removes them from the land. That's, that's precisely what we're talking about in this incredible connection in Isaiah 9 that then comes the great destruction through Syria and the Chaldeans. It's the same story. Yet this says the start of 70. But it's not really going to be the start of 70 but it will be the start of the end of days, which when complete, will have another end of 70. You must always remember the end of days are a compacted replay of things that played out over decades, centuries, and millenniums. 
Ecclesiastes 1 9. You see? So for Cyrus to come on and make the declaration after the head of gold is destroyed means that that first Babylon must be the Babylon smaller type Babylon play of uh, Iran, which is the first attack and the small Middle East war that breaks out before the North comes and destroys them and removes them. Then we get our play of Cyrus, of the rebuilding, okay, of the enemy coming, the destruction, the Lord here, the rebuilding actually starting, then the pit opening, war breaking out, going after them with the flood, two and a half years, leaving one year, Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, the final year, when the Lord has returned, feet down on the Mount of Olives, which brings us to the end of the 70th year of Jerusalem. Well, is there another? Is, is, is there another? Um, is there another? What was I going to say? A, 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 another 70 type of years that could end? Okay. Is there really still a play within this of, of a Babylon after they have completed the 70 years and another Babylon? Listen to what uh, Jeremiah 25 verse 12 says. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished. You're going to want to hear this. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans will I make perpetual desolations. Okay. That could still be the destruction of, of uh, 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 Iran, right? Iran and those coming with Iran to destroy at the end of 70 years of Israel right now. Well, Let's keep reading. Uh, and I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in the book of Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also, and I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to the works of their hands. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take up the cup of the fury of my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink. The what? The cup of his fury that they're going to drink? And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then I took the cup at the Lord's hand and, make all, and made all nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me, to which Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings of Judah thereof and the princes thereof to make a desolation and astonishment and a hissing and a curse as to this day. Unto Pharaoh, and it goes on and it lists all of these different nations. We go down to verse 26. And all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, listen to this, and all the kingdoms of the world, which are upon the face of the earth. Hello. All the nations. All the nations. And the king of Shishak shall drink thereafter. Therefore shall thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, uh, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink ye and be drunken. See, drink ye and be drunken. Drink and be drunken. Drink, drink and be drunken. What does it sound like? It kind of sounds like 
like how it all starts, doesn't it? Awake ye junkards, Joel chapter 1. Awake you drunkards, and weep, and howl, you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine is cut off from your mouth. You see? What is this? This is, again, this is talking about the beginning of tribulation. When does the 14 years begin? New wine. Hello. Remember that? New wine. The crux of it is September. When is the new wine? At the 50th day, Acts chapter 2, which is going to be what? The attack by Syria, the beginning of the 14 years. So what do you think the end of the 14 years might be connected to? Wine? You think maybe it's going to be connected to wine and drinking? Right? Being drunken on wine. It's everywhere in here. He's going to get them to drink. When did he say he would do it? See, the cup of wine, drinking, drunken. It's when 70 years are accomplished. Well, uh, right off the bat, I can see where you're thinking. You're saying, well, see, 70 years are accomplished. He's going to get them to drink. It's the beginning of the 14 years. Then you got Cyrus and everything starts. Hold your horses. Hold your horses. Okay? Don't forget. It's not, it's not uh, um, a conversation of the beginning of tribulation here. This isn't the beginning of tribulation conversation. You see, at the 50 days, the, the apostles and the, or the disciples were being accused of being drunk on new wine, of which they weren't. When the new wine begins, or when the tribulation begins, they're going to be cut off from wine, remember? The wine is going to be cut off. And it's not all nations. This here is talking about all the kingdoms of the earth, the entire face of the earth, all of the leaders are going to drink and be drunken. Verse 27, Jeremiah 25, verse 27. And be drunken and spew and fall and rise no more because of the sword which I will send among you. Fall and you will rise no more. Does that sound like the beginning of tribulation to you? Does that sound like, like the end of these 70 years here? How on earth could it possibly sound like those 70 years that we're about to come to an end to? When all of these nations are going to be the ones in cahoots bringing about destruction. Doesn't line up, does it? This has to be an end of another 70. Verse 28. And it shall be if they refuse to take the cup at thine hand to drink, then thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, You shall certainly drink. For lo, I will bring evil on the city which is called by my name, and should you be utterly unpunished, you shall not be unpunished. For I will call a sword upon the inhabitants of the earth. Well, this kind of still sounds like maybe the beginning. Because we know the sword is coming upon the whole earth, right? Verse 30. Therefore prophesy against them all these words and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Wait a second. As they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. 
Hello. Now you're starting to see why I titled this, right? A noise shall come even from the ends of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Verse 33. Actually, we can even go 32. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall rise up from the coasts of the earth, and the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried, but they shall be as dung upon the ground. Does that sound like the nations having their will and the nations persecuting Christians and the nations all working together against Christians to destroy them? Or does it sound like the complete opposite when they're all about to be destroyed and left for dung upon the ground? Do you remember what happens? Do you remember in um, uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 39? Remember this in Ezekiel chapter 39? Ezekiel chapter 39, as we know, is the end of seals, right? Is, is the end of the sixth year of seals when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion. This is the battle of Gog, right? What, what do we know about this? We've even shared it from 2nd Esdras. This is that battle, see? And an innumerable multitude shall be gathered together to come, as, to come and conquer him as you'd seen. Okay? Then shall he stand on Mount Zion, and Mount Zion shall be... Revealed, shall be made manifest, prepared and built as the mountain carved without hands. This is, this is the Ezekiel 39 war. What does it say about the Ezekiel 39 war? Verse 9. And they that dwelt in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set fire and burn weapons, both shields and bucklers and bows and arrows and staves and the spears and they shall burn them with fire seven years. Okay? We've taught on this. We know what this means. These seven years that they're going to burn them, okay? This is the six years of seals to the Lord's return, okay, on heavenly Mount Zion. At the end of this sixth year is the Ezekiel 39 war. At that Ezekiel 39 war, in fact, let's show it on this one. At that Ezekiel 39 war, you see, Ezekiel 39 lines up to the end of the sixth year. The Lord destroys, that's, he comes on, on the mountain carved without hand, right? That, that stone becomes a mountain that destroyed the image of everything that was this first Nebuchadnezzar gold and everything else and all the wars that took place. And then what happens? Well, then you've got one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven years of burning weapons. What happens after seven years of burning weapons? Remember, they, they burn them, but it was also turning their, turning their, uh, um, uh, their, their spears and their plowshares into pruning hooks. Remember? Well, then guess what happens? If this is the middle... What, what, what ends up happening? Ezekiel 39, 12 says, And seven months shall the house of Israel, see, this is the great multitude rapture, be bearing of them that they may cleanse the land. Seven months, they're going to be bearing those from the battle of Gog, the Ezekiel 39 war. We can prove how they're burning. Why is it only for seven years? Because it's from the end of the sixth year of seals for the seventh year of seals, six years of trumpets. What happens at the end of the sixth year of trumpets? The seventh year of trumpets, the Lord returns. There's a battle to destroy them. It's the final sword. Well, check this out. When we go to Joel chapter three, which is right, pre-mid post, Joel one, two, three. When the Lord is going to what? Bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. It doesn't mean bad captivity. It's when he, 
is going to bring them back. Listen to this. I will also gather all nations, verse 2, Joel 3, verse 2. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them. Did you hear that? And will plead with them for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. He's going to gather what? All nations. He's going to what? Plead with them. Sorry, that's uh, my wife texting me. Okay. <laughs> okay, honey, that's a lot of texts. So, um, okay, so he's going to gather all nations. He's going to plead with them. And it's because what? They scattered them among the nations and parted his land. Everybody thinks this is going to happen early. This parting of the land and the scattering of the people is what we were reading about in Daniel chapter 12. <coughs> you see, when the pit opens, Messiah is cut off, the war that breaks out goes after them with the flood. This is what it's talking about here. This is what we saw in Daniel 12, verse 7. How long is this going to be, Lord? And it was for a time, times and a half. These are the final two and a half years from mid-trumpets, approximately mid-trumpets, to the end of the sixth year of trumpets. And what does it say? When he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, these things shall be finished. See, this is when they scattered the power of the holy people. So when is he going to gather them? He's going to, he says, you've scattered them. You parted my land. I'm going to plead with you. I'm going to bring my people back. But I'm going to have all you nations come back first, of which I'm going to plead with you. And then he's going to destroy them, right? What was Jeremiah 25? Didn't he say that he was going to bring all those nations, right? To which he was going to destroy them. What did he say he was going to do? Uh, bring them with a sword. Uh, I will begin the city which called my name. You should be utterly unpunished. Uh, for I will call all nations upon the earth. The Lord shall roar from on high from his holy habitation. Um, tread against the grapes, against all nations. And noise shall become right here. Jeremiah 25, verse 31. He will plead with all flesh. This is when he's going to plead with them all. This is when he's going to gather them all there. Go back to Joel chapter 3. And we'll see even more. Okay, he's gathering in verse 9. Proclaim this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up uh, the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Verse 10. Beat your plowshares into swords. See, there was other scripture that was, you're, you're going to beat your swords into plowshares. Now suddenly here we are at the end when the seven years are done from the seventh year of seals and six of trumpets, now it's time for this final battle. Now they're putting their plowshares and pruning hooks back into swords and into spears. And it just so happens, listen to this, in Joel 3.13, put ye in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, get ye down for the press is full and the vats overflow for their wickedness is great. Verse 16, Joel 3. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. Then you see what? The future glory of Jerusalem. The land shall be cleansed, right? There, all of it's here. The, 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 the vats will be flow from the, from the grape for, for, the, for the crushing of the grapes. He's going to roar. He's going to gather them together. His men of battle, of war, for they've parted his land. He's going to plead with them. All of this is connected to the end of tribulation. This 70 years... Did you hear what it said is going to happen to the king of Babylon when the 70 years are over? 
when the 70 years are over, does it sound like it's the beginning of tribulation? This was the key. Does it sound like the beginning of the tribulation that we know of? Babylon is going to be destroyed and those with Babylon. He's going to bring all nations, bring a sword against them. He's going to bring all nations to drink of the wine of his wrath. To which is what? When he's going to roar from on high, from his holy habitation, that he's going to what? Tread the grapes against all the nations of the earth. He's going to plead with all flesh, bring the sword against them. And of the slain from one end of the earth to the other, they're not going to be buried. Does that sound to you like the beginning of tribulation? It doesn't, it's, it's not, only is it not only the beginning of tribulation, it's not even the end of seals. I just showed you that the end of seals, that first sword battle of the Lord, which is at the end of the sixth year of seals, that the rapture group coming in, the house of Israel is going to be burying them for seven months. This group is not going to get buried. So where is the wine, the treading of the grapes at the wrath of God? Let's go bring it to an end and prove out the point. You see, in Revelation chapter 17, we know there is what? The woman that sits upon a scarlet beast and the woman is arrayed in purple and scarlet. Revelation 17, 5 says, and upon her head, her forehead, was written the name Mystery Babylon the Great. Do you think there's another Babylon? If, if the first Babylon, if the first head of gold representing the king of Babylon is gone at the beginning, that means there was another one. Yet there's another play in relation to Babylon during the tribulation years that when the 14 years come to an end, when tribulation comes to an end and the 70 years of Jerusalem are over, there was another Babylon. It's the woman who is Mystery Babylon. What does it say? Let's continue reading. 17.6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the book of Revelation here. These are those who died during tribulation. If the 70 of Jeremiah talking about the treading of the grapes and destroying all of them, yet it's supposed to be somehow connected to the end of 70 of Israel, yet the king of the north is coming at the beginning, how on earth can that 70 be this one, yet still have 14 and be... You see? It has this duality built into it because it's telling us in Jeremiah 25 when the 70 years are over. It's going to be the time of the great, the great wine press and all the wicked will be dead from one end of the earth to the other and none of their bodies are going to be buried. They're going to be dung upon the earth. That is not the beginning of tribulation. That's the end of 70 years. But it's not the end of the 70 of Israel. It's the end of 70 of Jerusalem. Do you see why this had to happen after we received the revelation of the end of 70 and the end of 70? There was no way this could have been revealed without it. This is a difference between the Babylons. Okay, he marvels over the woman. <clears throat> Revelation 17, 8 talks then about the beast that she was riding. Um, uh, Revelation 17, 10. Okay, continue for a short space. The beast that was is not a uh, son of perdition. Uh, we've talked about that. We understand it. 
this, remember, this is like now, this is almost like the, the, the time of the first part of Trumpets, right? The beast that was, he was there for the 42 months. Then he is not during the first half of seals. And he is going to come out of the pit, okay? And goeth into perdition. That's when mid-trumpets comes. Verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which receive, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power uh, as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, give their strength unto the beast. Listen to this. Revelation 17, 14. Remember I told you at the end of the sixth year of seals is the Ezekiel 39 war? That is when the Lord's going to defeat the Antichrist. And remember the north, those that came against? Okay, do you remember that? This is what I was sharing with you guys in Joel chapter 2 when I said at the beginning to remember this. You see what happened? When he comes, he's jealous for his land. He does these things. And what did he say he would do? Okay, see the wheats are now, the vats of wheat are full. But what happened in, in Joel 2.20? But I will remove far from them the northern army and will drive them into a barren and desolate land. You see, who's he removing now? Assad at the end of seals in, in, involved in that Ezekiel 39 war. You see, if you remember from Luke 22, he talks about the disciples. They, he says, go get a sword and they come back. They turn and they say, well, we got two. And Jesus is like, okay, that's fine. One of the funniest stories in scripture. It makes no sense until you realize it's the Lord coming at the Ezekiel 39 war on, on Heavenly Mount Zion. And the second sword is at the end of trumpets. You see, this is that first one in, in Revelation 17, 14. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them uh, for the Lord, for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, all lowercase except uppercase L and uppercase K. All the rest is lower K, okay? And he says, um, and he that saith upon, uh, uh, sorry, and he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the horse sits are peoples, multitudes, and nations. We know that the ten horns are going to turn on her, eat her flesh, and so forth. Well, listen, listen to this. Chapter 18. Now we get the fall of Babylon. After these things, I saw another angel. Uh, the earth was lighted with his glory. Okay, Babylon the great has fallen, has become a habitation of devils. Okay, of every foul bird. All those that were enjoying the delicacies, see, drunk of the wine. See, verse 3. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard the voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. You see this, guys? This isn't the beginning of tribulation. This is the end of tribulation. Verse 8. Therefore shall her plagues come upon her in one day, death and mourning and famine. This is at the end. Those who live deliciously through her, they'll see her standing afar off, torment saying, alas, that great city Babylon, that, might, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. What, what is the judgment, guys? We know, she, we know that this Babylon is here during seals and trumpets. She's wearing purple and scarlet. Do you remember there was a reason why I brought it up at the beginning? Those that are going through the tribulation of seals and trumpets is like Christ on the cross, left behind Mark, left behind Matthew, scarlet and purple, or purple and scarlet. See, those that live lavishly, because those who will take the mark of the beast, those, all of those leaders, all those who went with the beast system, that were part of this mystery Babylon of the end. It's going to be destroyed in one hour, that great city and all of her costliness. Verse 20, rejoice over her, thou heaven and holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. See, he's not avenging her at the beginning. She's here during tribulation. 
It's not even the same wording as king for the first one that starts the 14 years. Clearly, this is the one that's the mystery Babylon. And this one is about the end, which relates to the time of what? The grapes of wrath. Okay? So we see there was that Ezekiel 39 war. And then you still have all this conversation about Babylon and the destruction coming on Babylon. See, great men of the earth, all nations. Now listen to chapter 19 of Revelation as we bring this to a close. 19.1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and honor, and power unto the Lord, uh, the Lord our God. Um, for true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath the, avenged the blood of his servants. See, we, we all know this has happened during tribulation. This is the end of tribulation. Uh, at her hand, and again, they saith, Hallelujah, and her smoke riseth up forever and ever, and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen and Amen. And the voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, a voice of a great multitude. You see, because the great multitude has been there since the end of seals in paradise, right? Come and as the voice of many waters. I think that might even be the pre-trib group saying, Alleluia, for our Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she be arrayed with fine linen, clean and white. What, no purple and scarlet? <laughs> is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Remember, this is the final wedding, right? Unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell to worship at his feet, uh, to worship him. And he saith unto me, see that thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren. I have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then it says, then it's a white rider, white horse rider. You've got a white horse rider that starts it, white horse rider that ends it. Pretty cool, right? Verse 1911. Sorry, Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat on him uh, was called faithful and true and in him righteousness. He doth judge and make war. See, there is making war. Just as we see in Zechariah 14, just as we see in Joel chapter 3, okay? Just as we saw in, in Jeremiah 25, his eyes were as flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and the name written that no man knew but himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, and the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in linen and white and clean. Now listen to this. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. There it is again. There's the nations. And he shall tread them. Uh, sorry. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. When the 70 years is told to us being finished in Jeremiah 25, it is not the story of the beginning of the 14 years of tribulation. Those 70 years are tied into like the start relate to the end of the 70 of Israel when they came in 1948 in the Count of Leviticus. But then you've got the end of the 70 of Jerusalem, which is directly related to saying what would happen to Babylon at the end of 70 was the great wine press. 
that, that, that's not going to happen at the end of 70 of Israel. Yet the great wine press, which seems to be the end in Jeremiah, it seems to be the end of 70. And then you would think, well, the 14 years come. But it can't because the great wine press that said would happen to them and to all nations is literally the end of tribulation. Do you see how it's all interwoven? Everybody knows that the grapes of wrath are the end of tribulation. And he that treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God to what? All nations. All those for the wickedness of the nations. And, and Jeremiah in 25 told us what would happen at the end of the 70 years of their captivity, that he would bring destruction of all nations gathering together to bring about the destructions as they would tread the grapes. There's no way that this picture of the end of 70 <coughs> could be the, the actual end of 70 that we're told to it when then Cyrus would come, when there would be a decree, then war would break out, and the Antichrist, then the Lord come on heavenly Mount Zion, and the, the first sword used, and then the rebuilding take place, and then the pit opened, and then Satan, and then the great wine press and the great wine judgment of the wrath of God. It's at the end of 70. But, but it's the end of 70 after the 14 years, even though there was a 70 that ended that had a Babylon that was out of the way because Cyrus comes into power. Clearly, two different typologies of Babylon, one that is a, a short one in the beginning, destroyed so that Cyrus comes on the scene to make a declaration to allow them to go rebuild, for which we know they only get the temple, uh, the foundation, and it's the whole story of the 14 years. Yet at the end of it is another end of 70, and that one relates to the actual one in Jeremiah 25, and it brings us to the end of 70 of Jerusalem, yet not the beginning of Cyrus and everything else. That's already over. This is the end of tribulation. And as I finished reading this in Revelation 19, there's no doubt. It's all there. So again, uh, verse 15, Revelation 19, verse 15. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with the rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his vestiture and on his thigh a name written. Here it is. You see that? Now he is coming in all uppercase, King of kings and Lord of lords. Listen to this. Verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the great supper, uh, sorry, unto the supper of the great God, that ye might eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on and of them that sat on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, small and great. Sound like the whole world to you? In the great wine press? Does it sound like they're being buried? Hello. Doesn't sound like they're being buried at all, does it? And, and we can prove, of course, that this is the end, not only from the great wine press, but it goes on to say in verse 19, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet 
that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast, and then that worshipped his image, both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. You see that? We know this is all the end of tribulation. The Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire at the end of tribulation, at the time of the great wine press. And when you get into Revelation chapter 20, you see, then, the, then Satan is taken, bound into the bottomless pit, not thrown into the lake of fire, because he's going to have this chance at the end of the millennial reign, of course, which he goes out to the nations then at that time. And you know what happens. You see? But when you get to the end of this, look what happens. After the millennial reign is done and there's this final Gog and Magog, not Gog only, it says fire came down and devoured them. And Revelation 20, verse 10, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. You see? Because they were thrown in at the end of tribulation. So you see what I'm getting at? Hopefully you caught that. There is a Babylon ending after 70, which is that first light affliction. Then the king of the north and those with them will bring about that second attack that will destroy them, which is like a start of the 70 years. You following? It's a shortened, condensed time frame to which there is also an end of another 70, which are the grapes of wrath. When Babylon is going to be destroyed, all nations gathered together, the great battle and the final war, which is the grapes of wrath. Exactly what Jeremiah was saying. Do you understand? I hope you guys are getting it. There was no way. There was just no way to understand that before. To have the hindsight that I was talking about and then now be at a point where we could see that there are two 70s coming to an end. One that starts and plays out 14 years, yet even though the one that starts, it seems like it's the one that ends it because it's the grapes of wrath. Do you understand there was no way to ever see that? Without knowing? 70 and 70? And a revelation of what? 14 years between it? To have been understood by first years ago, three plus four years ago, putting together the chart of the seven, uh, the, the seven Shemitah year chart and having to, to play with it and try to understand it and, and the years weren't fully matching yet, to now every single year covering and completing every single part that brings us to the 23rd year of 170 ending, which is like a beginning of them going into a captivity, but playing out the, the Cyrus and playing out the coming on heavenly Mount Zion to when this 70 is done, the grapes of wrath. Guys, this, this isn't an easy one to follow, I understand. For many of you, it will be. But for many of you that are still newer, you maybe need to spend some time in other videos or carefully follow through what was shared here. Slow it down, pause it, go into those, those pieces of scripture where it's talking about it. And understand what was what was spoken of. This is a mystery within a mystery within a mystery within a revelation. This took us years to get to. I was even stumbling it over the last couple of days trying to figure it out. What the? How could? How could seventy be done? Cyrus come on the scene, Babylon destroyed. Yet 14 years play out, and at the end of 70, it says that Babylon and all nations we brought to the wine press. There's only one way. There's only one way 
that any of this can play out. And yet Zechariah chapter 1, these 70 years. Yet the wine press end when 70 years are done. <laughs> you understand how impossible that is? There's no way it plays out any other way. <laughs> There's no way. Brothers and sisters, I hope this this sunk in. I, I hope you were able to see it and discern it and understand it. I know for so many of you, uh, for, there's just so many out there that are just like, I don't care. When, when, are we, when are we looking for the pre-trip? When's the rapture pre-trip coming? Well, with Leviticus 19 in order, with the counts of the Shemitahs understood, with the 70 years of Jerusalem coming to an end 14 years from now, I have no other reason to believe that the final option, the seventh Sabbath and the fifth and seventh month is the precise reason that Zechariah, something we have spoken on for almost five years, four and a half or so years, why it tells us that fasting in the morning, that they did it, for those past tense 70 years when they were in prosperity when they inhabited the plain it's all right there they were in prosperity until those 70 were done and then what happened they go into captivity i know i'm repeating myself but do you see then they go into captivity. But it's not an actual 70. It's the tribulation condensed time. And yet when it's all over, it's still the end of 70? Come on, guys. That's impossible. Except the Lord had separated 19 years between Israel and Jerusalem and told them when they came into the land, this is how you to observe it. And, and, and gave revelation within the Old Testament of how the house of Israel counted compared to how the house of Judah counted. To know that the house of Israel is Nisan, to know that the house of Judah, which are the ones who are in the land, is to Tishri. Hence, attack one, attack two, attack two. light affliction by, uh, uh, by Babylon, Babylon removed, Cyrus making the decree and the declaration. That goes to the end of seals, the Lord shows up. Yet there's still a 70 to the end of that. And that's the 70 of Jerusalem. And at that 70, the final Babylon will be destroyed in the great wine press. It's unbelievable. Brothers and sisters, I pray it blesses you. For those that, that it was too much for you, don't worry about it. I know where you're looking. We're all looking for this period of time right here. We are in the count of the seven Sabbaths from the 5th of June. Brings us to the true seventh Sabbath, the eighth of Av, and the destruction, or I should say the first attack of the fifth month, these 70 years, and it will end the 70th year of Israel, of Judah, Israel, those who are in the land right here, and there's the end of 50, and there's the second attack by the king of the north, by Syria, that removes them from the land of this 70 year, these 70 years, before the final one 14 years later. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.